opening um, statement. For the record, my name is Julia Mejia. I'm the city councilor at large. I'm also the chair of the city council's committee on education. Um, today, um, this public hearing is being recorded and is being live streamed at boston.gov slash city dash, excuse me, slash city uh, dash council dash TV and broadcast it on Xfinity Channel 8 and RCN Channel 82 and Files 964. We will be taking public testimony at the end of this hearing. If you are interested in testifying, please email ccc.education at boston.gov for the link. Today's hearing is on docket 0245, order for a hearing examining the implementation and outcomes of restorative justice practice in Boston Public Schools. This matter was sponsored by me, Councilor Julia Mejia, Councilor Kendra Lara, District 6, and Councilor Arroyo, District 5, and was referred to the Committee on Education on Jan January 25th, 2023. I don't have the part of the opening remarks in regards to I'm in compliance with the uh, government, uh, uh, the governor's hearing order around public safety and all that sort of stuff, Cora. So I'm going to assume I don't need to read that into the record, but just in case, I believe we are until March the 23rd able to um, host uh, uh, hearings um, via Zooms to ensure that we are adhering to uh, open media law and also making sure that we're able to conduct our business while also keeping the public safe. I just did the abbreviation of that just in case I was supposed to say it. I did the abbreviated version of that. I am joined by my colleagues in order of arrival, Councillor Lara, Councillor Breeden, and Councillor Murphy. Um, and as my colleagues uh, join, I will be sure to recognize you. Unfortunately, some of my colleagues are not able to be present today, and I would like to read the following letters of absence into the record. From Councillor Brian Rorell, District 4, Dear Chair Mejia, Vice Chair Murphy and Councillor colleagues. I will unfortunately be unable to attend today's hearing, but I am grateful to the councillors, to councillors Mejia, Lara and Arroyo for opening this discussion. Restorative justice programs are critical. They improve behavioral and educational outcomes, teach important life skills and like conflict resolution, collaborative problem solving and provide students with much needed social emotional supports while avoiding more extreme discipline measures and their lasting impacts. The city of Boston has officially had restorative justice programs for a decade and yet students from the Henderson and beyond continue to organize and raise their voices to demand these programs are more widely implemented. While restorative justice may not be the silver bullet, it is an invaluable tool. We must work to expand these programs at all BCS facilities as a first line response to behavioral concerns. With that in mind, and with, with apologies if these questions have already been raised, I ask the following. And that's for the administration, so be sure to incorporate these into your um, answers. With what data has been collected by the district on restorative justice programs efficacy versus traditional disciplinary methods? And while these programs are desperately needed and wanted, it is important that we ensure quality of service. What barriers currently exist to scaling the restorative justice program? Thank you, Councillor Rorell. And this is from Councillor Ruth C. Louisian. Dear Committee of Education, I regret to inform you that I will be unable to attend the Committee on Education hearing on docket 0245, a hearing to examine the implementation and outcomes of restorative justice practices in Boston Public Schools. When you have a punitive system such as timeouts, detention, and suspensions, the automatic response is to deny, responsive, uh, to deny responsibility because um, you know you'll get punished. With a restorative justice system, the incentive is to admit that you did what you, what you did because you know that there's going to be a process to make things right. Therefore, excuse me, furthermore, investigating, investing in restorative justice practices creates a community of teachers and students who spend less time on discipline and have more time for teaching and learning, and they work. I applaud the restorative justice programs like the restorative justice circles at the Young Achiever Science Math and Mathematics Pilot School, where they have asked questions like, what, are, what happened? 
how did it happen? How can we do, what can we do to make it right? Rather than punishment. There's accountability, community responsive, inclusiveness, respect, and healing on a deeper level. BPS must ensure that schools who want to do the work of restorative justice have the support and guidance to do so. My staff will be attending and I will, be, and I will thoroughly review the video, hearing minutes, and public testimony. Should you or any mem a member of the public have any questions or concerns, please do not hesitate to reach out to my office directly at 617-635-4376 or at rootsy.louisjean at boston.gov. Sincerely, Ruth Louis Jen, Boston City Councilor. Um, I was also informed that um, Councilor Arroyo will be running a little late, but will be joining us uh, shortly. Today's administration panel consists of Superintendent Mary Skipper, who will be with us um, for only 15 minutes, but she'll be with us from 12.15 to 2.30. Um, excuse me, 2.15 to 2.30. So we will make sure we accommodate that. Jill Kilton, who is the Chief of Student Support at BPS, Jody um, e, e, Elgi, who is the uh, Senior Director of Success Boston, Boston Public Schools, Deza Campbell, who is the Assistant Superintendent Division of uh, Schools, BPS, and Jenna Parafisuk, who is going to educate me on how to pronounce her name correctly, who is the Director of Student Support Services. We also have a community panel um, we have Rita Lada, who is a community leader and executive director at the Maverick Landing Community Services. Iman Hassan, who is the director at Stop the School to Prison Pipeline, and also works with the Massachusetts Advocates for Children. We have Leon Smith, who is the executive director of Citizens for Juvenile Justice. Paola Ruiz, who is a former BPS student, student at Tufts, and media assistant at the Maverick Landing Community Service. And Stephanie, I... Uh, uh, Google, who's the manager of arts, culture, and civic engagement at Sociedad Latina. Because Superintendent Skipper could only join us for 15 minutes, I want to open up the floor, um, if she's here with us, or, um, to share her thoughts regarding the following questions we have prepared. Um, we really want to get a better understanding, and I'm going to just read this into the record. I believe she's on her way. If someone could confirm, I know I'm a little bit early. Um, but I do believe that we did submit these uh, questions beforehand, so hopefully she'll have some time to uh, reflect. One of the questions that we wanted, just for the record, is for us to have a better understanding of how BPS um, defines restorative justice and what that looks like on a district-wide level. We'd like to hear what are some of the obstacles that the district has faced in overcoming the implementation of restorative justice district-wide. Um, you know, and if, if we haven't, if we have had them, you know, are, are we moving towards being able to implement this, uh, this um, restorative justice on a district wide level? If so, um, if so, what are the obstacles? What would the obstacles look like to make that happen? And if not, why not? So we really want to get at whether or not we're looking at seriously in implementing restorative justice district wide. And I'm just curious, you know, we had did we did ask to have a practitioner join us um, here, someone either on the school level um, or 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 someone else. And I understand that Arthur Collins um, is not a part of. I believe he's the restorative justice coach, Jillian. If someone could just confirm that, um, and and he's been at the job for a while, so it would just be curious to know if it would be it would be helpful for us to have somebody who is actually practicing it um, to provide some input. So if he's not here, we're just curious as to um, what void he uh, and voice he is. Somebody's going to be able to fill that void. Um, and we're just also curious about the investments that we're making. Um, on restorative justice coaches. Um, you know, we believe that this is part of the, the strategy to be set up for success is to have more coaches. Um, and I'm just curious if, if those are sort of the investments that we're, we're thinking of making. And I know that's a lot and she only has 15 minutes and I would like to ask my co-sponsor um, in particular before we have a little bit of time before the superintendent arrives, are there any additional questions that you'd like to add to this? I can, um, thank you, Councillor Mejia. Um, 
I can either wait for my time for like some kind of opening statement or ask my questions during the rounds. I don't need to put anything out before the superintendent gets here. Okay, great. So you don't have any particular questions specifically for the superintendent then? Is that what I'm hearing? Uh, questions for that I can ask for the, I can ask the superintendent when the superintendent is here. Yes, um, yes, what I mean, yes, what I mean. Are there questions that you're gonna, so that we allot that time? Yes, for, for, for me specifically, I'm, I want to learn about the investment for the Office of Restorative Justice and um, what does the implementation across schools look like? It's my understanding that everybody kind of just does their own thing and that's not how restorative or transformative justice works. There is a baseline of practice. And so how are we ensuring that that's being practiced across schools? Uh, and you know, we're spending a lot of money on SROs and surveillance cameras. Uh, over $30 million in the next five years. And we have three people who are staffing a restorative justice office. So how are we staying in alignment with our code of conduct where we're trying to kind of reduce um, these kind of punitive forms uh, if we are not investing in them at the same, at a minimum, at the same amount of investment that we are investing in the other kind um, of school safety interventions. Great. Thank you. Um, and to my colleagues, just want to be respectful of the superintendent's time. And I asked Councilor Lara and if my other other co-sponsors here, just so that because we have such a short period of time with the super. Um, but it's 12, uh, excuse me, I keep saying it's 12.15. It's 2.15 um, and just wanted to be mindful of time. Oh, and I, uh, I see that we have also been joined by President Flynn. Um, District 2 is also with us. So I just wanted to acknowledge that we have also been joined by um, President Council. Flynn, thank you for joining us. Thank you. It's good, it's good to be with you. Thank you. Okay. So I Madam Chair, Council Flaherty is on as well. Okay, great. Thank you, Councilor Flaherty. That's great to know. All right. So I am going to, in the interest of just time, um, and I also want to be super mindful and respectful of everyone, I am going to ask my, um, my co-sponsor if you want to share any opening remarks of anyone on the, uh, from, on the council side. Um, if you are interested in uh, saying some opening remarks while I while we wait for the um, superintendent, I'm more than happy if you could just show that by um, by raising your hand, and I could definitely. Okay, I see Councillor Murphy. You now have the floor. All right. Thank you, thank you, Chair, and thank you everyone for being here. Um, definitely hoping to get more information from this meeting around PBIS and how many people in these schools that are using this program have been trained on the framework and on restorative justice work. You know, we know that this doesn't just happen organically. Are we giving schools the frameworks and training that are needed to do this work successfully? It's something I hope that we get out of this conversation. And then making sure we're not setting people up for failure when we have the Blackstone with 700 students and one social worker, just one example of a school that definitely that's true across the system, that there's not enough people in positions that are trained in these different types of frameworks to support our students socially and emotionally. So looking forward to this conversation, knowing that this is an important piece to the overall success of our students, that we know many of our students are struggling for many different reasons. And the social emotional part is so important to me and I know my colleagues on the council. So looking forward to that conversation and making sure going into the budget season, like I did last year, and I'm gonna continue fighting, even though there was not an increased investment in athletics and arts that we're not just putting a couple extra dollars out of ESSER funding, which is temporary, but really making a bigger investment in before and after school programming, wraparound services, social workers at our schools. But also I've often said the, the good work that um, Councillor Anissa Sabi George did about getting nurses in every school and talking a lot around the guidance counselor needed every school. 
which is great. But if we don't then support them with the training needed, then we're just setting teachers up to be burnt out, stressed out, and making sure that all of those supports. And I know, Jody, that that's work that you do. So I'm glad you're on this call to really speak to that and make sure that every school is getting the supports they need. And that it's not just, uh, I think Council Lara mentioned, because I've heard the same, that restorative justice practices have been in place for over a decade in BPS, but not every school is doing it. And not every school has the training. And we know that administration turns over a lot and staffing changes. So how are we making sure that the funding is there when we get new staff and new principals with different visions that were across the board, making sure that this is a priority as a district, that we're making district-wide decisions, not just one-off school by school. So thank you, Councilor Mejia. Thank you, Councilor Murphy. I am looking to see if any other of my colleagues are interested in making any opening remarks while we um, wait for the superintendent to join us. I'm here, Councilor Mejia. Okay, awesome. All right, then you're gonna owe us an extra five minutes, just so you know. We're gonna keep <laughs> we're gonna keep on to that 15 minutes. That's restorative okay. justice right there. So we'll, I'm gonna pass over the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. So um, first of all, uh, just good afternoon um, to our city council members and um, to Council Mejia. I want to thank you for gathering us for such an important topic discussion. Um, you know, research shows that um, whole school restorative approach, um, one that includes our teachers, our administrators, our parents, our students, um, really encourages students to take responsibility for their actions and repair relationships with others. We believe it's important, um, you know, for us to take a holistic approach in addressing issues related to student safety. What happens in our classrooms, you know, is directly connected also to what our young people experience outside of school. Um, you know, they are not, they're not independent. Um, and I think we've seen that quite a bit this year. Um, we're gonna continue to uh, provide additional mental health services and resources such as conflict resolution, restorative practices, peer mediation training in restorative spaces to our students who might be struggling. And this is all in addition to the other kinds of student supports that we apply on a daily basis. We understand that um, caregivers want the best for their children and so do we. And so we want to assure our families that, you know, we're taking every measure we can to ensure safety while they're in our care. Um, and this is particularly important right now, as we see in this moment, as we continue with the effects of the pandemic um, and all that our students are, are struggling with and through. You know, our goal is not only to prevent violence, as, as I've spoken about, but it's it's also, you know, it, it's preventing it from, from occurring, but it's also to really uh, train and equip our students with the tools they need to peacefully resolve um, conflicts, issues that they might be having, uh, both outside of school in their daily lives on social media and then you know certainly in the, the halls of schools. As part of um, as part of my vision for BPS, you know equity is seen as a through line in our organization, meaning that it cuts through every layer of our organization. Um, and that means that in this work um, we're taking an equitable approach as we we do with our equitable literacy and as we are with our grading. Um, we're taking a closer look right now at implementing sustainable systems and structures that we believe are going to create the type of positive nurturing culture and climate that we all want in our schools. And that's really going to allow our schools to be learning environments that are accessible to all of our learners. Um, a large part of creating this culture is saturating our school communities with restorative practice. You know, when I say saturate, to really underscore the importance of making the work kind of prevalent everywhere, in our classroom, in every hallway, you know, in, in, in the cafeterias, on the grounds that surround our school every day. It has to be everywhere in terms of the fabric of the school. And we realize that for that to happen, um, you know, we not only need to make sure that our teachers and staff are equipped, you know, that they've been trained and given professional development, um, and that that professional development is accessible and practical to the work that they do. Um, but it's also that we have to do that for our school leaders who are going to be leading this work. 
And so we're doing and are committed to do this in every school. Um, since I came back to BPS, you know, we've been working closely across departments um, to really create restorative justice practices and to train staff. This was something that had been kind of highlighted in previous years in the budget, um, but it did not yet have traction. And so this is something that we're really taking on this year and will in the year's future to make sure that it is part of that fabric in our schools. And, you know, as I've shared before at, at prior hearings, I'm also restructuring the team to be able to support schools directly um, in a very customized, you know, way for what schools need, recognizing we have 119, you know, schools. Um, the regional network, which I know at this point the council is, is familiar with, you know, that regional network had, consists of nine school superintendents. Each of them leads a team of liaisons who support the schools. Um, you know, they, they get resources to the schools, they address issues with the school leaders, um, and they're also partnered with an operationals person in addition to the liaisons. Um, that, that mere structure is so critical in addressing issues in an efficient and timely way. Um, you know, the model also just really allows um, academic, professional learning services, data and, and transformation services, um, multilingual learning, special education, um, really all of those services to be delivered up and really customized in that regional model, all with the goal, you know, of improving the culture, the climate, the instruction, you know, attendance rates, um, you know, and, and in that with equity as the through line in each of those regions. You know, within this model, there's um, the operational leaders play a great deal um, of, uh, of support in the, the area of safety. Um, you know, there's, um, there's also just across the networks, 187 social workers um, at this point that are embedded across our high school, our, all of our 119 schools. Um, there's also um, 106 school psychologists, and we've added in 113 liaisons. So this is just giving a very strong structure of support for our young people. Um, since we restructured, um, you know, from in the divisions for the, for the network, we've also begun to look at a centralized approach to the work. And so, you know, we, you know, really acknowledging that the work has to be carried out in a very collaborative and yet targeted and transparent way across the networks. Um, it also has to be a way in which our students, our families, our staff, um, all of the professionals, both inside and outside of BPS, um, who deal with mental health and, ment and medical services, um, certainly the electeds um, and our, our school committee, that we're, we're seen as partners in the work to this. I mean, this is the ecosystem of Boston. And so, you know, in closing, as we kind of begin to roll out um, the new restorative practice implementation plan, which I know Chief Kelton um, will be sharing for the upcoming school year, um, I just, I also want to just call out a few aspects that we're going to also be continuing to build out. Um, one is around dropout re-engagement or what we call timeout that I know Councilor Mejia um, has, has offered that term. Um, really focus on, you know, reducing chronic absenteeism, which leads to that dropping out of that timing out. Um, building up educational options and alternative education options to meet students where they are and get them to where they want to be. Workforce development, which is critical. Our students need to be able to command salary and learn skill at the same time. Um, youth jobs, peer mediation, um, the out of school time is gonna be essential. You know, We see the incidents that happen in that three to seven, three to eight, and then on the weekends and then during the summer. So really building up as a city that um, out of school time opportunity for youth um, with training. Uh, trauma sensitive and restorative justice practices that can also be extended to the partners working with students in that out of school time. Um, and then, you know, certainly investments on, um, you know, in security technologies that, that are more efficient and less invasive um, than what we have previously seen. And then there's just a lot more, you know, which you'll see in our budget process as well. So with that, I'm just, I appreciate the time and, you know, the, uh, the invitation from Council Mejia. I'm going to turn it back over to Jillian Kelton, who's the Chief of Student Support for us, and I know that she's eager to talk through the, the implementation plan for the restorative justice practices. Yes, and before you go, before you turn it over to Jillian. I'm not going yet. <laughs> sorry, we're going to hold you here for a quick second. Sure. 
Um, Superintendent Skipper, and we really do appreciate your time and energy um, spending uh, some time with us. I, I think as we continue to um, develop our relationship and, 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 and build uh, spaces of trust and, and these trust building exercises is what I'm calling them, I'm just curious if you'd be willing to be a little bit vulnerable and just share with us some of the things that you're struggling with as you think about what uh, it looks like to implement restorative justice across the entire district. Like if we could hear from you a little bit about um, what are some of the pain points, like we have 125 schools or 118, I can't keep up yeah. these days, but if you could just talk to us about what a vision for implementing restorative justice across the entire district, what would that look like? And what are some of the, the pain points around that implementation? It, I didn't hear that. And if you mentioned it, it, I, I, it didn't sound as explicit as I, would be helpful to me to hear it. Sure. So I think um, I, I think Chief. I don't want to steal Kelton's thunder either. I mean, I think she's going to get to this, but I will just say from a vision level, I think anytime we're trying to roll out an initiative that we believe is critical to the work we do, um, it takes deep professional development. It takes, in this case, with restorative practice, it takes really the entire school community understanding what what we're doing, and that's from school leaders certainly down to our school staff, um, but also our students and the community, you know, in the form of our parents. So this really, you know, as we roll it out, will be a way to involve and engage the entire school community at a time when, you know, there's, for our young people, they are really struggling. You know, they're struggling with regulation, they're struggling with all the trauma that they've experienced, they're playing that cycle out, both outside of school and inside of school. And so, you know, when issues happen, they happen sometimes in multitude or kind of like back to back. Um, and, you know, everybody has a lot of different emotion around how to be able to support and uh, manage those kinds of a crisis when they happen. Having a common language and approach is critical for that so that it isn't being dealt with through the emotion. It's actually being dealt with because we've been trained how to do it. We know how to go into a situation that has the young person at the center or the young people at the center and we're able to apply what we know in a consistent, equitable way across our schools. So that happens with a, you know, a strong implementation plan, resources to enact that plan, a concentrated effort that, you know, in any of these things like equitable literacy is part of, you know, the, the, squal the school quality plan because it's seen as something that's that important for it to happen. So I, I think we'll be working closely with regional soups, the operations leaders, to make sure that uh, as the PLCs and the PDs happening in the in the networks, this is part of what they're being um, supported and trained on. I also think that even as you roll it out, you need to coach it. You need to have coaches that can come in and work like on a regular basis, process when a situation happens, how did the school handle it, how did, the, how did the staff handle it? How did the students and the parents respond to it so that we continuously improve and get better at it? So that is, I think, you know, for us, the commitment, we see this as extremely important. And we also know that it means giving our schools and school communities the resource they need to do this well. Thank you. I'm gonna give my co-sponsor an opportunity to ask some questions. Councilor Lara. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you so much, Superintendent, and to the rest of the administration for being here. Um, I think the questions particularly that I had for Superintendent Skipper were high level about the investment, right, which I mentioned before you got here about how um, if we want to be in alignment with our code of conduct in terms of what our vision and what our values are, where we want to do um, move away from less traditional discipline, then we have to invest in it in the same level that we're investing in all of the other quote unquote traditional ways that I consider to be more punitive ways of doing disciplines in schools and we're not. And so when we talk about rolling out um, restorative justice in all of our BPS schools, there needs to be a practitioner in every school. They're right, like you're talking about coaching it through. How are we embedding this in everybody's learning? When I was at the Boston Public Health Commission, we decided that racial justice and health equity was gonna be a deep intentional part of our work. And so every single person that ever got high after that, any person that came to work at the Boston Public Health Commission had to go through a two day training on racial justice and health equity and it was part of the onboarding. And so I'm really interested in, and, and mostly this comes from like my, organ, my, my organizational management background, 
how do we take it from vision to practice and what are the ways that we're going to, you know, what are the ways that we're going to get there and what investment do you need, especially because we're entering budget season. Like I, in order for me to feel like we are meeting the moment, we're seeing the issues with our students um, in their behavior, right? We're constantly in the news about what's happening with young people. And so the city council on the outside has a lot of power about what policies and what programs we implement to support young people and our families and our communities, but we have less of that power in BPS. And so when you're sending us the budget, I wanna see that you are also, like if we're doing everything that we can out here, I wanna see that you are also investing in those things and those young people. And so I, I guess it's less of a question and more of an observation is that the restorative justice the way that we're doing restorative justice at BPS is not in alignment with like what restorative justice is supposed to be. It's not well resourced. And so I, I, I would, I need to see that for me to feel like we are really putting safety, security and growth of our young people first. Uh, and I, I want to see that coupled, you know, restorative justice at the center of it is really about give like communities having the agency to solve their own issues. And so when you talk about community solving their own issues, we're also talking about the student community. And so I want to see an expansion of peer to peer conflict resolution programs, yes. like the ones that I was a part of when I was at English high school, where you know if there was an issue, they got assigned to us and we sat down and we facilitated the conversation. And so yes. there are a number of things that we can implement that are restored. Um, and so I would, I just want to, it's less of a question, but I just, I, those are the kind of things that I want to see, um, if we're going to really talk about implementing this properly. No, I, 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 I just wanted to just note that, you know, from what I understand, there's only one to three coaches for the entire district. And when we talk about, um, investments, I just want to kind of level set with just that reality. And, and if you could just expand on how we're going to get to where we need to be with, with limited resources. That's right. So I think I think that um, Chief Kelton is going to explain some of this in the implementation plan. But um, we're we're working at kind of at two levels. So one is regional, and so at the idea of the regions, we will be building out coaches for the for the regions. I think we're also looking at the school level to come in and kind of work at a liaison level and really get somebody, you know, to Council Lara's uh, point, somebody that's school based, right? That in, in each of the schools to be able to carry that work on. The peer mediation is something that I, I really feel if we had strong peer mediation right now, we could we could just really offset a lot of the conflicts that young people are happening because they would have a vehicle to bring things to. This is an area that we have to sort of um, very quickly um, kind of build up. And there are some po really positive models. There are some schools that have it already. There are others that don't. And so I think the other thing in this is to really um, understand through an audit for us um, what are the social emotional supports that schools have? What don't they have? Um, what have they invested? You know, some of them have invested ESSER dollars to build out and to try to build capacity. Um, and so really trying to get that sense of what each community is doing to then create that kind of building block. Um, so th this is going to be the heart of the work in, you know, over the next 12 months is getting this foundation right, both at the regional level for support, but then also at the school base. Um, so there'll be a lot more to come on this. I do think that Chief Kelton has some of this in her uh, presentation to talk more granularly, but it, it's uh, music to my ears and I really do appreciate the council's support on this because we're in full agreement. This is the direction to go. Thank you for that. I, I just wanted to you know, note that the code of conduct when it was first updated in 2013 to include restorative justice practices, alternative to suspension, you know, however, the Office of Restorative Justice is only staffed by three people, which consists, you know, to support 125 schools, but the Department of Safety Services currently employs 75 um, Boston School Safety um, officers at school sites throughout the city. Um, and so I, I just feel like there is, and then the, we're also intending to spend millions of dollars over the next five years on new surveillance cameras. So I think that this whole conversation in terms of how we are defining safety, psychological, you know, physical, all of that is part of safety. When I think about public safety, it's not just the physical safety, but it's also the social, emotional, and mental and spiritual well-being of our yeah. students. And I, and I think that we need to really have a conversation about what is safety and what is restorative. And I just I'm and encourage that you um, have popped in to this particular hearing because it goes to speak volumes to your investment in the conversation. And I am looking forward to hearing from your chiefs 
um, to what, what, what it's going to take for us to get there and what the council needs to do to help push you all in that direction and, and to support you all in implementing a vision that we do believe um, is, is the way to, to go. So Superintendent, I know that you have a hard stop, but just wanted to acknowledge the time and energy that you spent and it's uh, well regarded and appreciate it. Thank you. And I do really appreciate the opportunity to come in and, and to be able to address all of you. So thank you so, so much. Thank you. Thank have you. a good afternoon. Thank you. I am going to, in the spirit of always leading the way that we do, we're going to start off with community. Um, and, you know, I do have opening statements, but I think in the interest of time, I'm going to reserve them. Um, and I'm going to move straight into our community panel because after all, we're here to listen to the people who we serve. So the hearing format is going to be, we have two panels presenting today. The superintendent has already presented, um, but moving forward, we're going to give space to community. Um, and then we're going to move on to the administration. And I want to know that the administration has already been provided questions uh, before the hearing. So my hope is, is that um, we will spend um, less time and, uh, and trying to look for things that I'm hoping that they will already be here. So I am going to um, start off with our first uh, panel. We have, I'm just going to start off with Rita. Lara, I, um, Rita, Lara from Maverick Landing, you now have the floor. Thank you, Councilor Mejia, and thank you to everyone. Um, um, so you know, I could say that you have five minutes, so let me okay. put on my timer. All right, put on the timer. So, my time, to do that. Thank you. So our organization, Maverick Landing Community Services, um, really began its foray into restorative practices at the onset of the pandemic. Um, you know, we were distributing half a million pounds of food and going on all these food runs and there was a lot of stress. I personally was dealing with a mother who had passed away and uh, from COVID. And later that year, my, my brother's diagnosis with um, pancreatic cancer, which he, he survived. But we it came by way of an interesting place. It came by way of the restorative justice uh, unit at, at Dave Rollins office and the Transformational Prison Project. And then in came the neighborhood trauma team. Um, and you know we we began you know running community circles. And I can't tell that was uh, you know three years ago now. Uh, I can't tell you how much it's it's changed the way we operate, um, the way we think, the way our team co comes together. Um, it's a team, it's supportive. We actively listen to each other. We listen with both the head and the heart. Um, it's, you know, it's changed our, our way of, of operating. And I was struck when, um, and I think she's spot on, when the superintendent said that, you know, in, it needs to saturate the environment. It's a whole organization approach. And that's exactly it. That's exactly it. We now have three uh, trained Peace Circle keepers. We do circles at Maverick, but also circles in the community with other Peace Circles from the trauma, Peace Circle keepers from the trauma team. And, you know, it's interesting to me. I think when we, when we talk about it often, and, you know, the, the training is basically modeling it, right? You have to be in it breathe it, live it, experience it, and then you know it. And then you do it again, and then you know it a little more deeply. Then you do it again, and then you know it a little bit more deeply. And, and, and that's a level of saturation that I think is required to really change an organization or, or a system. Um, even the way we, you know, we have huddles where we meet, even the way we do that is in a circle format. Um, where, you know, where we, we always also sort of have prompts around self-care and, you know, uh, it's, it's um, you know, restorative practice is sort of a, a way of, of creating nurturing spaces. I can't think of a more important investment than that, um, given where we are, right, in terms of we're in, a, in the midst of a mental health crisis. We, in the midst of seeing a lot of violence in schools, uh, you, the answer, right, 
is to saturate the environment uh, with restorative and nurturing practices. Um, and uh, you know, that's sort of all I, I really have to share. Um, and it strengthens, right, the network and the environment because you know I don't I've kept my people and you know and the people who work for us have been with us for three years. They don't you know they're with us. <laughs> you will find huge benefits. It will keep your people. <laughs> you will deal with less sort of of a revolving door. You'll see less school fights. It's not going to be. Uh, a quick solution. It takes years to permeate, but boy, when you see that happening, it's impressive. So again, I'm coming from a community perspective, but I can envision a world where in schools, you know, maybe in detention, you talk about, you know, you have circles about self-care and sleep hygiene <laughs> because, you know, I know that our young people need that. Um, I, you know, I can envision a world where peers talk to peers and, and settle things before they escalate. Um, so I hope, I hope you all, you know, I hope that, you know, our leaders in the city and the schools, and I, and I know Julia's office has this vision. I hope we can elevate that vision and make it happen and make sure it's really, um, it really gets the investment it needs. Thank you. Thank you, Rita. Thank you for your testimony and for helping us understand the, the return on that investment um, that we make. And some of it is financial, some of it is emotional, um, but regardless, the outcome of that work really shows uh, um, in terms of the things that you have already been able to do in three years, right? Just by making that investment. So thank you for that. And you finished just on time. Good job. I, I'm okay. I'm going to move on to um, Iman. You um, have been such an amazing thought leader in our office and really do appreciate all of your support. Um, I'm going to transition over to give you the mic, but before I do, wanted to just acknowledge that my third co sponsor, um, Councillor Arroyo, um, has also joined us. And just to give people who are tuning in up to speed, we are, um, we heard from the superintendent and uh, we have transitioned to the community panel. So, um, Iman, you now have five minutes and the floor. Thank you so much. First, thank you for bringing us all together. This is the first time I shared space with Mary Skippa. I'm the chair of the 222 Coalition, which makes up some of the most incredible advocates for children that are rethinking discipline and are rethinking the way that we can create better environments to keep our children in the actual classrooms where they should be developing the skills they need in order to become the parts of Boston that they need to become. And so um, I hope that you know, this is not the first time that someone who's in that advocacy world gets to share space with Mary Skipper to have the conversations we need to have to bring the alternative solutions that Boston Public School deeply needs. I just want to start with, I started my week Monday morning um, on the phone with a black mom who's in Boston Public School and for two hours she was crying. And this shows that this is more urgent than ever before. And I know Mary Skipper has talked about the fact that Children are incredibly dysregulated from the trauma they have experienced during the pandemic. Unfortunately, our systems have not done the reform we needed to in order to figure out how to keep children in the spaces while they are figuring out um, how to be the people that they currently are with the trauma and with the dysregulation that we as adults have felt as much or even greater than children. Um, I'm the director of STOP, as you have heard earlier, STOP, the school to prison pipeline at Massachusetts Advocates for Children. The school to prison pipeline refers to a series of policies and practices which function to push students, disproportionately students of color and students with disabilities, out of school and into the criminal justice system. Data collected by the United States Department of Education for Civil Rights suggests that exclusionary discipline is applied inequitably. We know that. It's not news to any of you. Nationwide and in Massachusetts, students of color, particularly students with disabilities, are more likely to be suspended or expelled and arrested in schools. Black students in Massachusetts 
schools are almost four times more likely than their white peers to be suspended from school. And Latinx students are three times more likely than white students to be suspended. In Massachusetts, one in four black children with disabilities are suspended, compared to one in 11 white students. Children who have been expelled or suspended from school are twice as likely than their peers to drop out. And students who are arrested at school are three times more likely to drop out than their peers. Students who drop out of school are then eight times more likely to end up in the criminal justice system. The school to prison pipeline starts early. The theory that cute children are not criminalized, it does not exist. One in six children who are not at reading proficiency level in third grade drop out or do not graduate from high school, a rate four times greater than that for proficient readers. Nearly one in four children who are reading at below basic level in third grade drop out or fail to graduate on time, which in turn substantially increases their chances to become incarcerated. In order to effectively disrupt the pipeline of children being funneled into prisons, more attention must be paid to alternatives such as restorative justice before excluding children out of the classrooms where they can learn and get to the proficiency levels, which then statistically shows they're more likely to graduate high school and more likely to stay out of our criminal justice system. Last year, Massachusetts recognized the importance of that. And with Section 37 age and three quarters, which was amended through the section uh, section 29 of an act addressing barriers to care for mental health, chapter 177 of the acts of two, uh, 2022, the amendment effective in November 2022 expands existing provisions related to school discipline practices described already in section 37 age and three quarters. And it now requires before suspension that school official consider, and, and might I add here, before long-term and short-term suspension, that school officials consider alternatives to suspensions and support disciplinary decisions with written documentation why alternatives such as re restorative justice could not be used or should not be used. So this is the law. And we have deeply thought about how and why children should be supported from being pushed out of school before any disciplinary actions, the traditional disciplinary actions are taken. So this brings us to restorative justice. We must properly invest into alternatives such as restorative justice. Restorative justice is a set of practices that challenges us to develop solutions which reject the traditional criminalizations of children that we have seen in Boston public schools over and over again, and that we see Boston public schools continue to invest in. Restorative justice is grounded in indigenous peacemaking traditions from across the Americas. We, I just want to remind us all here in Boston, are sitting on indigenous land. And so why not use these peacemaking traditions to rethink the way we build community? Restorative justice allows communities to undo harm by naming it and focusing on providing alternatives to punitive discipline, which in turn promotes positive school culture, including safety, and emphasizes learning and creativity and respect and responsibility. Currently, we don't see Boston public schools make the right efforts to support staff and children in receiving the tools to properly, properly implement restorative justice. Instead, we see proposals to do the very opposite. We see proposals that would create new positions, such as the ones that were proposed in December. Boston proposed hiring 18 community connections coordinators and one community violence response advisor, 18. And we know how little support the restorative justice team has, has received so far. The community connection coordinator is described as people who will, among other activities, follow students as they leave school and coordinate with transit police and Boston public uh, police department at local stations as students head home. Community violence response advisor is set to monitor ongoing issues between students who self-identify as street affiliate most, um, via social media. This means that Boston public schools will be surveilling students' social media and then using some undisclosed criteria to identify students whom the district should monitor. This proposal would disproportionately harm students of color, partic particularly black and Latinx students, immigrant students, and students with disabilities. It would furthermore criminalize students. The criteria for these different positions um, or the criteria for um, assuming who's gang affiliated are not grounded in any procedures that have been given to the communities or grounded in procedures or in, in constitutional protections or privacy laws. As an advocate, 
we are deeply confused by why these positions, 18 of these positions would be considered when we have not even invested in creating the mechanisms to support restorative justice in a way that could become an alternative, which now by law, every administration should be considering before pushing a student out during short or long-term suspension. So I just want to finish this up with, we can't oh, allow it. I, I wanted to just let you know that we, I've let you go over and I Oh, I'm to, so sorry. Yep. I want, so, I want to be super mindful and respectful. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. Yep. Thank you. Um, and I was trying to not cause you any trauma, but I kept... <sighs> I'm so sorry. But no reason. You could incorporate some of your answer, some of the additional. Absolutely. And the, absolutely. Perfect. I just want to be mindful of everyone's time. And so I appreciate you. I, no, I, I appreciate your, your grace. I'm going to, um, Leon, I don't know if you could hear the, the timer go off when it was going off, but um, that would be great. I, I, if you can't hear it, I will have to, you'll have to hear my voice because we're not in person. It's a little bit harder to manage the sure. Zoom. So you can't see my nonverbals if you're not, if you're in a hustle and a flow here. So I'll just be like, hello. All right. So all right, um, all right. All right, I, I will so. do my best to be prompt and efficient. So thank you all for having me today. My name is Leon Smith and I'm the executive director of Citizens for Juvenile Justice. We were founded in 1994 as the only independent statewide nonprofit organization working exclusively to reform and reimagine juvenile justice and other youth serving systems in Massachusetts. We advocate, convene, conduct research and educate the public on important juvenile and youth justice issues. Our work extends beyond the traditional boundaries of the juvenile legal system to address pathways and pipelines that lead young people directly or indirectly into formal system involvement, into the harm of formal system involvement. That's important because we truly believe at CFJJ that enhancing restorative practices along with implementing other student supports will not only greatly improve school climate and safety in Boston public schools, but will also reduce school exclusion and situation rising to the level of law enforcement referral, which both are part of the school to prison pipeline into court involvement and ultimately incarceration. So again, CFJJ is a major proponent of restorative practices as a key developmentally appropriate approach for young people. But we believe in Boston, there are three areas that are very crucial for the district in getting restorative justice right. One is education on restorative justice, not just throughout the district with staff and teachers, but reaching parents and students. There needs to be an initiative from Boston Public Schools to educate parents and students on restorative justice and restorative practices, the model, how it works, and how, will, how it will be utilized. With any initiative, proactive education is needed to promote buy-in. It's important to share success stories about restorative justice from other districts in Massachusetts, throughout the New England region, and nationally, where we know that restorative schools have been effective at reducing school exclusion, law enforcement referral, and improving overall school climate. And I believe by prioritizing outreach on the restorative process, informing concerned communities of how restorative justice really focuses on accountability and healing and how it can not only address harm that has happened, but proactively deescalate potential conflicts before they rise to a troublesome level, we can ensure that our parents and our youth are part of this solution and that we truly have buy-in on every level from the superintendent down to the families that attend our schools. Um, and I think we have to ask if this has not happened, is that part of why restorative justice has not been more effective? Second, funding. Funding is absolutely key. We must be sure that restorative practices in the districts are adequately funded, including ensuring that there's adequate staffing to implement in schools throughout the district, with the priority, of course, on districts that may be experiencing more challenges. But we also need funding to ensure that there is both adequate training up front and adequate ongoing professional development for staff to ensure that the model, the full model of restorative practices are implemented and not just implemented effectively, but implemented pursuant to the model. We can't have a piecemeal approach. We have to give staff and teachers who already are doing so much the support they need and the ongoing professional development they need in order to effectively execute it. And the third thing that I really think should be focused upon is that 
we need to have metrics at the district level to measure the impact of restorative practices. We need to evaluate staff and people practicing restorative practices to ensure that the model is being implemented with fidelity at all times and implemented with fidelity regardless of who the child is engaging in it. Just, you know, looking at our work in the youth justice space, we see many model models that work well in a vacuum. But if bias is allowed to creep in in their application, it can create disparities, which is what we do not want. We want this approach to help address disparities, not exacerbate them. We must also define how we're going to measure success, including data that should go to this committee, as well as be publicly available, showing the number of cases or situ situations receiving restorative approaches and outcomes, including qualitative stories. Because when we have success stories through restorative practices, people need to hear that, communities need to hear that. You know, in conclusion, and I'll wrap up, you know, the research on restorative practices is clear. Ahmad and others have done a great job of illuminating. You know, when it's utilized both in and out of schools, we're implemented effectively. People who feel victimized feel like they're treated more fairly. People who have committed harm feel that they're held more accountable, and it can lead to a decreased likelihood of recurring incidents. And I'll conclude with the current instit institute at Ohio State, which states that restorative justice changing the focus from being strictly punishment to repairing damages caused by misbehavior and preventing its reoccurrence. It helps promote a culture where every school citizen stands in a relation of responsibility to the larger school community. That is a value we should be instilling in our young people at Boston Public Schools. And it is a value that if we instill it through really going all in on restorative practices, we are going to see improved school climate throughout the district. Thank you. Thank you, Leon. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to move on to Paola Ruiz. Um, and, you know, as our community panelists are staying on board, I think in the interest of time, I'm going to go after our community panel, I'm going to go straight into our BPS panel because they have a hard stop at five. And I want to make sure that my colleagues have an opportunity to ask questions to everyone. Um, and I want to ensure that we have a good conversation here. So I'm going to next to Paola Reese, followed by Stephanie. And I know Stephanie wants to share a video and I wanna be super mindful of time and how we can make those things happen. Um, so I am gonna go uh, to Paola Reese. You now have the floor and five minutes. Awesome, thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, as Rita mentioned, I uh, work at Maverick Landing Community Services and I help with um, youth programming and um, all of the media things that we do. Um, and I think this summer we started implementing restorative justice practices more intentionally into the work that we do, particularly with the youth. Um, and I think an observation that I took away from that um, was that it's really important to make the restorative justice language accessible and comfortable to young people. Um, so I think that's one thing that we need to be very mindful of as we implement, as we more intentionally implement this in schools. Um, and something that somebody mentioned earlier um, was having more funding for like sports and physical activities. And I guess I'm wondering and thinking about how fitness and movement can work um, side by side with restorative justice. And I think that's a really good way of um, making restorative justice more accessible to young people and in school spaces. Um, and another thing that really stood out to me um, that I think Council Lara said was um, restorative justice, the point of restorative justice is helping community feel like they have agency of solving their own problems. And I think like while I was a student at, in BPS, I didn't necessarily feel that way. Um, so I think I would just like reinforce that statement um, that really stood out to me. Thank you. Paola, that's it. Dios mio. I thought we were going to. OK, so you guys are lucky. Um, Paola uh, is, uh, saved us a little bit of time. So thank you, Paola. Uh, and I just wanted to note that Paola, uh, as a former BPS uh, student and now um, in university, it just really speaks volumes to making sure that we have people who are who are living the realities and are still connected to the work. So I just want to say 
thank you, Paola, for, for bringing your voice and perspective into the space. I'm going to go next to Stephanie. And because um, Paola has saved us some time, I do have a special guest that nobody knew about that I'm going to be bringing in. And I'm going to bring her in, y'all. It's Edith Bazil. So she's going to be joining us as a quick panelist. Um, so I'm going to go next to Stephanie. You now have the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, to the amazing uh, members who've spoken so far. Thank you, Paola um, and Boston City Councilors who are here on this meeting. Um, so my name is Stephanie. I am a resident of Boston. And since 2019, I have been a youth worker at Sociedad Latina. Um, currently, I'm leading our arts and civic engagement team. Um, for the past few, for the past several years, I've worked alongside our BPS students to push forward education reform campaigns around restorative justice and ethnic studies opportunities within our school system. At this time, I would like to share uh, a portion of our student video testimony. The full video with all of the BPS student testimonies will be available for the record. Um, but if we could please share um, that first minute uh, portion of the video. Um, I had sent that uh, to, I believe, Ethan, who would be able to uh, share a screen. Okay. I love this multimedia use of bringing youth voices and perspective into the space. So thank you, Ethan, for helping us make that happen. Just want to make sure that we can't hear the video just in case. Ethan, I don't think we can hear the video if we can. the sound quality was uh it was iffy um but the video will be available uh for um public record um and that was just two of our students at Sociedad Latina sharing their experiences um with uh punitive uh measures that are taken in their schools and the disparities between Boston Latin School and the Dearborn um STEM Academy um which again will be available uh to listen fully 
Um, but I also want to add on to this and talk a little bit about um, some solutions uh, that we want to suggest from Sociedad Latina's perspective. Um, so I'll start with um, a 2017 study that um, we are referencing on student surveillance that found that the use of intense uh, coercive surveillance methods, especially when applied disproportionately to students of color, harms students' interests, perpetuates racial inequalities, weakens trust in governmental institutions, and sends a really harmful message to the world that students attending majority white schools should enjoy greater privileges and have superior privacy rights. This is an issue of racial equity in our school systems, um, and an increased uh, surveillance of students leads to an environment of fear and distrust and dis diminishes students' willingness to confide in school staff when they are experiencing problems. I want to share this to address the student concern with using this method as a tool to surveil and intimidate young people. In order to build truly safe schools, Boston needs to engage in a community-centered process and build up alternative mechanisms of supporting our majority BIPOC students. Um, our school system needs to address the root causes of issues students are increasingly facing, such as absenteeism, struggles with mental health and youth violence. BPS needs to focus on preventative solutions, some solutions being provided, being uh, providing adequate and long-term training of all adult staff in BPS on practices which will support our students, including conflict resolution, trauma-informed practices, eliminating racial biases, uh, de-escalation, positive youth development, and restorative justice policies. Uh, these are long-term approaches, and therefore we need to invest adequately in these long-term solutions. Uh, from my understanding, the current code of conduct in BPS is highly punitive and behaviorist, with little room for re-engagement of our young people through restorative practices, which build a positive school culture. We urge the district to move away from the current policies and instead implement trauma-informed and conflict resolution approach defined by community involvement, restorative justice, and increase appropriate mental health support. I want to note um, the Citizen for Juvenile Justice, um, which put out uh, a report recently showing examples of districts that are leading by example in re-envisioning school safety. Um, one example I want to note is the LA Public School District. In February of 2021, the Los Angeles School Board prompted by sustained advocacy from students, approved a plan to shift $25 million in funding uh, previously allocated for school police into $36 million, into a $36.5 million initiative called the Black Student Achievement Plan, which added 221 psychiatric social workers, counselors, and namely climate coaches and restorative justice advisors to schools. Although BPS has begun funding for social workers in schools, we need to think about the resources we lack, namely the climate coaches and RJ advisors. Students in the LA Public Schools District report that the climate coaches help de-escalate conflicts and help provide social and emotional support for struggling students and restorative justice advisors are helping to shift the school's disciplinary practices to focus on rehabilitation and reconciliation to address conflict. On top of this, we need to uh, continue to increase the funding for structured after-school programs, including expressive arts, music, and athletic programs. We need to continue funding peer mentoring and skill development focused job placement programs for students. It is also critical that the students who need support during out-of-school time are also able to receive the resources they need. Lastly, you will, as you have all heard here already, we need to lead this process of reimagining school safety in conjunction with our students, our parents, and our community input. They need to be included in revising the district's plan to minimize reliance on law enforcement and how to handle school conflicts at schools. The work needs to begin now at the community level, and we need to focus on adequately uh, allocating funding for these solutions. Our community has been requesting uh, so that this can be implemented uniformly across all of the schools in the district. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. And thank you so much for bringing the visual um, and media, multimedia here. And, and I'm sorry that we could not hear uh, the video uh, correctly, but we will make sure that it's uh, entered into the record as a public, um, for the public to consume. Okay, thank you. I am going to, um, I've asked for Edith Fazell. Um, there's there's no public hearing on education unless Edith is on it. And since you are coming on board um, to just uh, add a little bit of context, I'm not gonna give you the full five minutes, but I will give you the rest of the time that um, 
our uh, Paola did not use. So how about that, Edith? So I'm gonna give you three minutes, okay? And thank, thank you so much, Councilor Mejia. I just wanna say that like the disparities that exist in education, restorative justice is not something new as a need. We know that all adults, students and staff have been traumatized by the pandemic. And restorative justice is really looking at how do we repair the harm that has been caused by unjust policies and have impacted students and how do we give them a voice? So I wanna give you a really quick example. So think of students in a circle, given norms and being given the power to sit with adults, with their educators and talk about how they feel about school and being asked three questions. The first question is, what do you like about school? And so the, there are rules to this. I'm not gonna go through all the rules, but our students need language to develop and express their agency because they have thoughts and they are impacted. So the students ask, answer the first question and, and the students are told they can say anything they want. The power is shared with adults. Adults do not have more power. And in fact, you can say things that might feel a little uncomfortable because you're telling adults how you truly feel. So for example, if I'm giving you chocolate and you like vanilla, you can say you don't like that. And so these are third graders, fourth graders, developmentally appropriate. And then you ask students, what don't you like about school? And, and one student in this circle said, well, you know, and, and they're given permission to say this. I think my principal should be fired because he yells too much and he's always accusing me of doing something wrong. And then the student went, because he couldn't believe he said that about his principal. He covered his face. And that's okay, students need to be able to give candid feedback about what is working for them. Some of the students said, I would like to have more black teachers. Or, you know, I want books that look, books of people who look like me. And so how do we have a conversation with students about whether they're told that they are doing a good job or a bad job? How about we turn the tables and allow students to express how school is working for them? <clears throat> and we do it in a structured way where they're not getting in trouble, where we can get feedback, where we can rethink policies, where we can say your voice matters, where we can say that, you know what, if this is not working, we can change it. The third question is, if you could imagine 15 years from now, from now, and you had a magic stick to change one thing in school to make it better for you as a student, what would that be? You would be amazed at what students come up with. You know, our students want to be successful. Our teachers want them to be successful. Our leaders do too. But we need to have a collective conversation where students are empowered truly to say what is working and what is not working without the penalty of punishment and, and, and um, other things and building trust. So this is a trust building exercise. It's like saying that adults are not always right, that sometimes we miss the mark and students need to be able to say their truth about this place where they spend six hours every single day and things happen between themselves and um, between them and staff. And so that's just one small glimpse of what it looks like to have a restorative justice circle and really engage in this work. Thank you for listening. No, thank you, Edith. I, I cannot have a, a hearing without your voice that deals with education because you always bring it and ground us. And in, in what this is about is really figuring out what we all need to do and every single voice gets us to that step closer. So thank you for, for sharing with us and, and joining us. I'm going to, in the interest of really moving things along as I'm gonna move right into our BPS panel only because we really wanna make sure since we only have you until five that we can ask questions. So I just wanna thank our um, community panelists for their patience as we transitioned over to the BPS panel, knowing that our community activists um, and community panelists have already helped us set the stage for what this conversation um, needs to, to be grounded on. So I am going to move on to um, Jillian Kelton, who is the Chief of Student Supports, and I'm really excited to hear from you, Jillian. Um, I, 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 we have four people from BPS, so I think um, 
would you like to do 20 minutes collectively? You know, would that be helpful? Yeah, I think, you know, for us, we want to, you know, Councillor Mejia, we, we spoke about creating a more collaborative um, effort in terms of these hearings and really making it a dialogue. And I want to do that. I want to, I think that's an important and really the best way for us to do this and to, you know, partake in some of our own restorative practices with one another. Um, Beautiful. So, you know, I, I, I want to, I don't want to just like talk at people, but I also want to, let me just start by saying that um, we have a lot of work to do. Um, and that is clear. And if anything, the pandemic has shown a not so kind light on the areas that we, we are lacking and areas in which we don't have the proper cohesion or the proper collaboration. And it's work that is so important for our young people um, and that is, is necessary. And it's our job to do it. Um, it's our job to do it collectively with the students and the families and with community members, and we're aware of that. Um, so I really hope that these types of forums can be used to help guide um, our work. We want to look to you for support and guidance and as thought partners. Um, you know, so we want to bring ideas that we have and plans that we have made to talk through them um, and, and get collaboration on them and get, you know, buy-in because this is going to be, this isn't also just about the schools. This goes beyond the schools. This is about our communities and the schools plays a pivotal role in that. We recognize that but we have to all work together because what happens in our schools has to be mirrored in our communities as well. We have to all be doing it together. Um, so one of the things that also has struck me is that, you know, we've been going back and forth between restorative practices and restorative justice. And I think the simplest way to understand it is that restorative practices involves a continuum of interventions and strategies that are um, proactive and responsive. Restorative justice is, is a subset um, of restorative practices, and it's primarily only responsive in nature. Um, so I will use the term restorative practices more often, um, and I'm happy to also share that definition with anyone who needs it in writing. I'm happy to do that. Um, but I think for me, being fairly new in this role um, as chief of student support, I started in this role in August, um, you know, I've been in the district since 2005, actually since 2001, I started off as a pick career specialist at Madison Park um, and then uh, moved into a guidance counselor position. But um, I think for me specifically in this role as chief, um, I wanted to give myself some time to not just go in and, you know, plow through and say, this is what needs to be done. This is how we're gonna do it, but take some time to also observe, to also see what work was being done by our colleagues, because just because work is happening in silos doesn't mean it's not the right work, right? So we want to highlight and uplift the right things that are happening, and we wanna magnify them and then spread them out across the district so that we're creating equitable educational experiences for our young people. Um, so I have started to develop or developed a restorative practices implementation plan, um, for next school year. And I think that it takes into consideration the fact that this work has to be, and, uh, the superintendent said it and somebody else said it too, when they were talking, I can't remember who it was, but it has to saturate our schools. Right, so it has to be happening every day in every classroom for every student. And in order to do that, we have to have people in our buildings who are the experts, but then also people who they can lean on that are leaders in the work in our district. So that means sort of a two-pronged approach to supporting the work of in, in, um, implementing restorative practices in our schools. And one of them matches up with our network model, which is, um, 
creating restorative practices coordinators at the, at the network level. So that's a position that we're starting to explore um, and, and how important that would be and you know how we create the budget for that and the funds for that. Additionally, we want to use the model that we've been using in schools for both our bullying prevention specialists and similarly our homeless liaisons, which is um, having building-based experts and every single building, two of them, who are continuously trained um, in restorative practices and become the on-site experts for restorative practices. Um, I think, you know, once, you know, every school will identify their two restorative practices liaisons, they will be stipended, st stipended for their work. Um, and then additionally, we'll set up a consultancy model with the restorative practices coordinators at the regional level. Um, we want to use these building-based positions as well as the district positions um, to do professional development for school staff. We have to, part of, the, part of what's gonna really make this work, right, is that it has to be a top-down model. So we have to get buy-in from our school leaders, from our building leaders. Um, we have to ensure that their buy-in is very clear and that it's part of their priorities going into the school year, that it's talked about in our August Leadership Institute. And then additionally, that we ensure that time throughout the year is given to restorative practices, professional development during school-wide PD for every school. That has to be part of this. Um, we want to have PDs that are run by the building-based liaisons. Um, and we also want to ensure that the building-based liaisons are getting the proper restorative practices PD beyond that by our district experts. We also feel that it's important for other staff members to be, or I'm sorry, for other district positions to be trained in restorative practices. That means our operational leaders, our district social workers, um, and other support-based staff like family liaisons, guidance counselors have access. Um, and the same emphasis is placed upon this PD. Um, I think, you know, the biggest struggle that I find in being in the position that I'm in is that obviously so much time and energy is put into teaching and learning and academics, right? These are schools, that's, that's what's supposed to happen but we have to be putting in as much time, effort, and professional development into the social, emotional, and holistic support of our young people, especially now. That is our responsibility. And teaching and learning isn't gonna happen at the level that we want it to unless we start to really provide spaces for our young people to heal from the traumas that they are enduring and have endured and will continue to endure. We, it is our responsibility as educators to give them those tools. And part of this comes in the form of restorative practices. Um, I'm talking a lot, I can tell because my mouth is starting to get dry. So I'm going to take a break for a second. I'm also like getting a little emotional because I just, I mean, this work is important to me. I, I do this work, I have done this work because this is important to me because the work of student support is important to me. I will say before I forget it, that one thing I do want to touch upon and we can talk about it at any point as Councilor Mejia, you often ask, you know, how can we support, what can we do? And I think where we will lean on the city council is, we wanna be having these conversations in community spaces as well. We have to be having these conversations um, outside of school walls, in community spaces, at community gatherings, so that restorative practices are not just felt in school, but they're also felt in other places in our communities. So I'm gonna pause for a second. Um, I appreciate that. I appreciate you taking care of self and understanding that that's what you need to do right now. And I would love to give Jody the opportunity to have the floor. You still have time on the timer here to keep on keeping on. So Jody, you now have the floor. Thank you all. Um, I have to say that this has been a really um, eye-opening conversation for a number of different reasons. One is I think we are all on the same page in thinking about what our priorities should be, thinking about the way that our students and staff and families have suffered 
particularly during the dual pandemic. Um, I think that that we as a district have have highlighted. I've worked very closely with Dacia Campbell for a number of years on the code of conduct and looking at the school to prison pipeline, looking at disproportionality of suspensions, looking at the way in which we apply discipline is something that that we in the district take very seriously. So it's nice to hear from all of you that you do understand how important it is to build supports for students so that they can um, be their best selves in schools and in their communities. I do want to say that, that this is work that we have been doing for a long time, building um, student support teams, building communities in schools that address student social emotional learning. Um, some of you are on the, um, the, the prep meeting. Um, RJ has been, or restorative practices have been part of the work that we do at Succeed Boston and we've done for a very long time. We open our day with a restorative circle. We close our day with a restorative circle. And I've always been really clear that if we could do that at Succeed Boston, that we can do it anywhere across the district. So I think I, I was really struck, Rita, by what you were saying as well about the impact it's made on um, in your agency in terms of the adults. And I think that, that when we look at the way that we're delivering services, um, we want to look from, from the, we want to go from the top down. So Jillian referenced um, the adults in the building. We also want to make sure that central office staff are trained. We want to make sure that the language of restorative practices is a through line and is a basis for which we are communicating with one another. Um, so I'm really excited that, that we've had this opportunity to talk about this today. I do want to point out that, that um, sometimes it seems like, like um, maybe people ought to come and visit our schools and see what's going on. Um, I certainly would welcome anyone to come to the Counseling Center and see the way that students engage with us talk about, listen to the way that students talk to one another and share their concerns. Um, because I think that we have been working really hard for a number of years to bring student voice forward and to provide students with a way that they can be heard and bring their whole selves to, um, to their school experience. Um, I guess that's all I would say. I'm really excited to um, to think about how we may deliver and implement restorative practices across the district. And um, once again, I would encourage any of you to set up meetings with us. We'd be happy to talk with you and have you see what goes on in our schools. Um, so thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Campbell. Good afternoon, Council Mejia. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I don't have a presentation prepared. I'm happy to talk through um, any or a answer any questions that anyone has in terms of the intersection of restorative practice and the code of conduct. I, I can even just speak to that if, if, if you want me to. You don't mind. And I mean, as, as the uh, assistant superintendent of division of schools for BPS and, you know, someone who has been in the weeds, it would be helpful for us to have a better understanding of what implementation looks like in terms of how you are, you know, overseeing and helping to support the district um, in, in your work. It, I mean, again, I always yeah, want to just- I can, I can talk a dog off a meat wagon, so, <laughs> <laughs> right? So just in terms of, uh, we rolled out the uh, the 2021 code. Um, it was uh, voted on in, in uh, January. Um, it's, again, we had to align a lot of documents relating to that and we rolled out training. Our training really has been focused on in alignment with uh, restorative practices. And it, it was done for a few reasons. Um, one is, you know, we really took seriously um, to making sure that schools had alternatives to suspensions. They know what that looks like. 
Um, you know, BPS really has been reducing their suspension rates over the years, but we haven't really done a good job. And some of um, folks have mentioned, I think it was Iman who mentioned in, in a lot of the areas in terms of um, with our black students, with our students of color and uh, with our Latinx students. And so this year we were really focused on that and, and, and our training was hyper-focused and then I, I apologize. Um, my phone. Uh, so the, the, we rolled out training really in that vein of looking at tier one supports. Um, this code this year or this 2021 code there was a strong emphasis on making sure that schools are not using suspension. Again, this code we adopted that there would be no suspensions from K to two, and that also that uh, suspensions from grade three to five would be limited to five areas. And even then, alternatives to suspensions had to be tried before. Um, with this new law that came out, um, uh, it wasn't actually a new law in the sense of there was it was always a mandate to try alternatives to suspensions. Um, this new law really focused on making sure like it took out discretion before schools could say that they were trying alternatives, right? And they could say that they were doing some sort of restorative practice, but they now have to show exactly what it is and it has to be directly connected to the student and to the incident that's going on. Um, I will just make a correction that the law really speaks to not just RJ, it speaks to restorative practices, right? It speaks to that schools should be trying mediation, conflict resolution, collaborative problem solving, you know, and using curriculum such as PBIS, trauma-informed learning. So the vision really is, um, it, it's consistent with the new law. How we're implementing that, again, is we rolled out training and training looked like whole, it whole, looked like whole district. We actually, this year, um, focused, we had a, we did a lot of training. We did something in addition to what um, Chief Kelton stated, um, all principals do attend the uh, August Leadership Institute. But this year, we, inst we actually created um, a management operation institute. And we did um, a cycle of trainings related to the, the rollout of the code of conduct. And the code of conduct was rolled out in three different modules. Um, we continued that training throughout the spring, um, excuse me, throughout the fall. Um, and additionally, um, we talk about that it wasn't one and done. Um, the superintendent and the chief talked about investments um, that the district made. And so one of the, uh, in addition to having social workers for every network, we scaled up from having five operational leaders um, and up to nine, so uh, one for every region. And they receive intensive ongoing training. I had a training with them yesterday and they also train the uh, administrative team members at the school. And our focus this year again has been um, tier one, making sure that we are giving schools uh, the resources and tools to keep students in classroom, to not use punitive measures, to use restorative practices, such as mediation, such as RJ, such as collaborative problem solving, so that it does not scale up to suspensions. And even, so with the uh, with other uh, suspensions, in terms of long-term suspensions, indefinite suspensions, instead of, un and also expulsions, there are checks and balances. Schools can't just unilaterally um, suspend students. Um, they really have to check in with the operational leader. And again, we're really focused on looking, what are some of the restorative practices you're trying with this student? or you're trying with the class or the school. So we're really just focused on building that up. And everything that we do, I do in partnership with uh, Succeed Boston. Uh, we use Succeed Boston heavily as a tier two um, uh, alignment, meaning students will, can come out um, of, this, of the building and go over and get uh, supportive services. At the beginning of the year, um, Succeed Boston is really excellent about pushing into schools and, and giving them the supports. Thank you. Thank you. I am going to move on to Jenna. You now have three minutes. Thanks, Councilor Mejia. Jenna Parafinzik. Not as hard as it looks. It just looks scarier, scarier last name than it is to pronounce. I'm the director of student support. I'm actually not going to take up a lot of time except for to say I um, support the social workers, uh, restorative justice, and home and hospital. Uh, I'm also uh, fairly new to this role, but have been a social worker in the Boston Public Schools for 17 years. 
Uh, we are committed to ensuring, uh, we have 187 uh, social workers right now, including our district social workers. Um, we are in, uh, incredibly dedicated to ensuring that they are uh, trained um, and have continual training for, we have a monthly professional development and continue to ensure that uh, we are embedding that into our schools through our social workers. We also know that they aren't the only ones that can do that work when they're being asked to respond, uh, but they certainly are a catalyst of moving the work into the schools. And um, I would just also agree with the counselors and the questions about our, our investment, and we know that we don't have enough uh, in order to be productive across the district equitably, and we want to you know, ensure that that happens as well. But happy to be here for questions as well, but don't want to take up more time. Thank you, Jenna. And Jillian, since you do have a little bit of more time, do you want to wrap anything up before we move on to my colleagues and questions? No, I think I, I think we can move into questions. I think we'll like get more into things as we, you know, talking through concerns and ideas um, and ways to collaborate through the questions. Okay, great. Uh, um, before we dive into questions, Iman, I see you have your hand up, and I just wanted to acknowledge you. Can I speak or did you, did you want to say something before that? Okay, so we're going to move on to counselor questions, but I wanted to just give okay. you the floor if you had anything to say before we do that. Oh yeah, I just wanted to clarify, and I hate to be the attorney here, the amendment to 37H and three quarters was a bit more significant than Dacia you had described. It actually changed the requirement to all considerations had to be made now with long-term and short-term suspensions. And before it was only long-term suspensions, which does pivot quite a bit and changes that. So I hate to be the attorney, but um, it is a very, very significant change that has been made to the disciplinary world. And I would like to clarify that so we can move on. Okay. I just. Can I rebuttal? Yeah, Ms. Campbell, listen, you know what? I think that people are going to realize that when I chair a hearing, I'm really about a community and collaborative process. So, Ms. Campbell, you are more than welcome to respond if you want to, and I'm okay with that. I just want to clarify, I mean, it was, it was not a significant change for Boston Public Schools, who had been implementing um, and asking for that documentation. That's what, what, what I'm referring to. It has not been happening in Boston, I'm sorry. It just hasn't been, and now it's a law. So as a practitioner, I have to say it was not happening, but now it's the law. So it helps me as an attorney that it is the law, but it was not happening in the district. So this is why we're all here today to figure out what's working, what's not, and what are we gonna do to get us all to where we need to be? Um, because we don't know what we don't know, and sometimes the way people interpret things are different. The law is such a, a way of misinterpretations, and so I think it's really crucial for us to lean in and even utilize, you know, we keep going back between restorative justice and restorative practice. You know, I think about restorative justice as institutions and like changing systems and, you know, practices is just kind of like, we're going to try to do this and this is what it's going to look like here. But I just think that we're at a moment now that whatever we do in one school needs to be cut across every single school and just uh, somebody's um, earlier points here is around those investments and making sure that this is about shifting the culture and the mindset of the environments that we are sending our kids to. So there's a lot of work. Some of it is gonna be legislated and some of it is going to be regulated and some of it is going to be um, fought again. So at the end of the day, we're here for all of it. And we could all agree on that, right? So in the interest of just being super mindful and respectful of everyone's time, I'm gonna hold off my questions and I'm gonna lead with my co-sponsors. So it's Councillor Lara, then followed by Councillor Arroyo, and I'll go in order of arrival. Okay, so Councillor Lara, um, we do have five minutes for each buddy, everyone's questions. And if there's a second round, we'll bring, we'll come back to you, okay? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, my question first is for uh, BPS, has every, teacher been trained on what restorative justice is and BPS? Is there, and I'm assuming that some of the plan for implementation is to get everybody trained. Yeah, so that's part of the school um, professional development that I talked about um, that'll be run in the schools for the school staff. Do you in have a timeline? 
by which yeah, like, so this whatever. should happen. So schools have professional development days before students come back. Yeah. Um, and a lot of that time is spent going over code of conduct, um, other, um, what's the word I'm looking initiatives for the year. So mm -hmm. this would be built into that time. And then I think my plan um, to talk through with the school superintendents is that every school leader then provide a mid-year check-in because somebody brought it up and it's such a good point. Um, I think it was uh, Leon Smith brought it up around um, the metrics and ensuring that we are doing things with fidelity. Um, and in order to do that, we're gonna have to have check-in points and we're also gonna have to um, staff this initiative with a data and impact specialist to ensure that we're measuring what we're doing and if it is effective. Great. How many uh, teachers are in BPS total? About six. I'm not even I'm not even going to pretend I know the answer to that because I don't. But it's amazing. about 6,500, and I can tell you that that um, more than 2,500 staff have been trained. So 2,500 of the 6,500 staff right. are trained. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and I there. So just to be clear, I appreciate the context that you shared, but there is not an answer about a timeline when you expect to have everybody trained. So the first part of the training for them. Um, we're going to design the training will mm -hmm. happen before school starts. Great. So there, so, and that's for the other 4,000. Yes. So by the time that the next school year comes, everybody will have had at least one training. That's my plan. I, thank you. I appreciate mm -hmm. that. Um, so, you know, for, and I know that I only have five minutes, so I'm trying to, to make this quick. You, restorative justice and transformative justice is inherently like, community centered and it's inherently like an abolitionist framework. And so um, we are in these kind of paths as elected officials and people who work where we're trying to implement something that's supposed to live outside of the state, inside of the system, right? Within like the school structures. And so where is the community in the implementation? Like where are the mama jays where are the circle keepers out in the neighborhood inside of bps how are you connecting like what is that like i i appreciate just like making sure that we're making an impact picking up all of the data and this is like an indigenous practice that is like this this is meant to be a community practice and so i also don't want to over professionalize this thing that is meant to really deeply connect our students to each other, really deeply connect our students to their community. Like it's, you know, it's it's an impactful thing. The data is there, it, it works, and we've seen it work, and we have all of the data of how it works in other school districts, and we know all of those things. And so my concern is that we are not implementing it properly, right? We had the, we had the, the incident with the Mission Hill School happening at, in my district. And a lot of what was, the, you know, the leadership was saying there, was that the reason why they weren't doing anything or the reason why they weren't reporting or the reason X, Y, and Z was because they were like practicing restorative justice or practicing alternatives to. And to, when I see that as a restore, you know, somebody who grew up in the restorative justice movement as an abolitionist, as somebody who comes to the city council doing this work in my community for over a decade, I'm like, that's not what restorative transformative justice is. Uh, and it raised, that is the first time as an elected official that it raised the flag to me that we are not doing this properly. And what happens when we're not doing it properly is that it's ineffective. Mm -hmm. And then we get people who can say, look at this unwieldy school system. We need cops. We need the schools. We need to do X, Y, and Z. We need to whip the kids into shape or they're not going to do X, Y, and Z. And it's because the alternatives that we know work, the real transformative things that we know are good for our children, we're not implementing them properly. And so then we can't make the case for the good stuff because the other stuff is much more sensational and much more high impact and much more easy to frame. And so, um, yeah, how how are we into integrating community into into like this practice in terms of like ex how are the walls of the school becoming more porous and transformative and restorative justice practitioners from the community being kind of like brought into the process? So that was kind of my ask to Councillor Mejia is you know where we want to lean on the city council a little bit and brainstorm and think through ways um, to do that, that we, you know, would be effective. I mean, obviously we have effectively partnered with community agencies and, um, but I think in this, you know, 
I've been in a few conversations now with Councillor Mejia, and they have been very collaborative in nature. And I, I mean, maybe this maybe this is the wrong answer, but I mean, I feel like this is an area where we can actually collaborate together on is how, you know, how we can in our schools create a more seamless outreach into our communities, how we um, create these wraparound services that extend beyond our school walls um, and our schools become hubs, right? And that it is a seamless transition from community into school and school back into community. Um, so I think that that will take support and thought partnering with the city council and something that, I mean, maybe it's, I don't know, maybe this sounds ridiculous, but like something we could do together and work on together. It doesn't, um, sound, it doesn't sound ridiculous at all. Okay. Um, Thank you I for know, saying I that. I was like, one, I'm still- so... No, not at all. I have one last question, Councilor Mejia, because I know that I only have five minutes and sorry. Um, and yet, yes, and, you're, and your five minutes did go over, but you know, considering you are the co-sponsor and you have a lot of expensive background in this area, I'm going to indulge you for another one. So go Thank ahead. Thank you so much. I am really, really concerned about the, the community connections coordinators. I'm really concerned about them. I'm concerned about their role. I'm concerned about what they're going to do. I'm concerned about that being like a softer way to define this more like punitive thing. And I, I need to, I need somebody to tell me what they're doing. I, I need you to make me not concerned about them. Don't be and, concerned about them because they don't exist right now. Yeah. Well, we're we're kind of we're, we might we're gonna promise some resources, and I need those resources to not go to this thing that I am concerned about and go elsewhere. And so, can we? Can somebody share more about it? Like, what are you thinking? Why it doesn't feel in alignment with the direction that we're trying to go? Um, and it, it, you know, again, being transparent and trying to just be very real, mm -hmm. um, we brought it to a community group. The it was premature. Okay. The reception was um, not good. It still actually haunts my dreams at night because um, it was awful. And, but that's like a learning point for me, right? So again, being new in this role, part of doing the work that is right. It's not about what's doing what's easy. It's about doing what's right. And what's doing, when you're doing what's right, it is oftentimes extremely uncomfortable. And that was extremely uncomfortable. And which signified this probably isn't right because it feels this, you know, doing it like we have to create spaces where we have honest and real conversations. And in the spirit of that, the feedback that we got on those positions was that they were not the right fit for what is the need right now that we are seeing in our communities. Mm -hmm. So we are listening to that feedback. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councilor Lara. I'm going to move on to my second co-sponsor, Councilor Arroyo, followed by Councilor Breeden. And then just so the colleagues who are listening in, I will be going back to another round of questions depending on what we have for time. So I'm sorry to keep you all on task, but I definitely want to make sure that everybody gets their questions in. So I'm going to move on to Councillor Arroyo. If you are here with us. Yeah, I'm here. Okay, great. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. I'll try to keep it to exactly five or thereabouts. Uh, this has been a very informative uh, hearing. I, I mean, I'm already, obviously I'm co-sponsoring this, so I'm already all in on, on restorative justice practices. I've actually seen them up close. I've seen them actually change people, change the way in which they've gotten to things and actually be restorative uh, in a real way. Uh, so, you know, I think people think about uh, restorative justice and they come away with the idea that somehow that means no consequences, that means no accountability, but it's actually the very opposite of that. Um, and I have seen that create really deep, uh, profound change in the way in which future conflict is handled and in the way in which those relationships and those impacted operate with one another in a way that I think is transformative. So I fully support this. Uh, I just want to be on record uh, as being somebody who gets really frustrated. And I'll, I'll, I'll tie this in. This is part of, I recognize this is question time, but I also, this is sort of my opening on this. 
One of the issues that we consistently have is we have people who are calling for more police in schools or calling for more punitive measures or calling for things that we actually know do not work uh, and things that we actually know cause harm. And often what I have seen is systems bend to that uh, because it's the easiest, lowest hanging fruit thing to do. The problem that I have with this is that usually when they make those arguments, they'll say, well, we tried it your way and it didn't work, but we haven't actually. And so my, my major frustration here, we had this when I voted with other colleagues against uh, raising police budgeting uh, so that we could get uh, people to respond to overdosing or um, folks who were dealing with drug addiction or folks who were homeless with a compassionate non-police response. And they said, well, we tried that and it didn't work. Well, no, actually, we didn't try that at all. It turns out your version is actually all we've been trying and it still doesn't work. Uh, and so this version of this uh, conversation, for some reason, front and, central has, front and center has been, you know, the kids aren't all right. And what they really need is sort of police officers in schools and they need more uh, discipline and tough love and the kind of adjectives we use that actually I have seen only lead to broken adults. And so for me, uh, I just want to be clear and on record that I want to see our budget and I want to see our funding match this, match the things that work. I am tired of pretending that we are doing things that work and they're failing rather than the fact that we're literally just not doing them. Uh, and so I think right now, I think Kendra asked some questions about this, but just as a quick question, and obviously this is not an indictment of the people who are doing this work. Uh, it is an indictment of folks who are not investing in a continuation or the furtherance of that work. But in terms of the size of that staff right now, is it is it literally four or five people in the restorative justice for the entire city? There's three. I gave you two more staffers than you actually got. Uh, there's no world where that model can be extrapolated to the rest of this school system with three staffers. It's not even close. And so before, and I'm putting this on record here, before anybody, my colleagues, the mayor, anybody in the city advocates for funding a full officer to be in that school building, I'm going to be advocating for those resources to go towards this. I want to see these numbers growing. I want to see these folks coming in. If you got money for that, then you got money for this. I have not seen that work. I went to public schools, full disclosure. I have been to public schools. I have gone through metal detectors. That is security theater. It never made any student I know feel safer. And so the idea that we're gonna just put sort of police state type mechanisms into our schools and that's gonna stop it. We have children who are dealing with PTSD. We have children who are dealing with uh, something that frankly none of us who are adults can relate to. I don't know what it would have done to me psychologically to have two, three years of sort of out of school, out of these relationships, out of these normal forms of associating with one another, what that would do to my social development, my societal development. Um, I can imagine that it's incredibly difficult. And I think we're seeing that borne out by data and by research that children are struggling with depression at rates that they have not in the past, that we are seeing suicide at rates that are troubling. And I do not believe that what we do to get to the under causing and underlying root of that is police that. I think we need restorative justice practices. I think the social workers are a step in the right direction. I think the family liaisons are a step in the right direction. But every time I hear a conversation about putting police in schools because this stuff is failing, we don't fund this anywhere near the same amount. Even right now, we have safety resources, safety resource officers that we have. How many, what's the number on that? Councilor Mejia, I know, I think that's already been, is it 70 some plus? Yeah. Do we know the I number on that? The, ex the expansion of the security cameras alone is like $30 million. Yeah, in the that's just with the, the 70, but in terms of staffing, I think it's 75. Yeah. This stuff infuriates me. I don't do well with these kinds of hearings because the fact of the matter is I, I don't need any proof from any of you that this works. I know this works. The data shows that this works. At a minimum, all of the data and all the evidence shows that that other stuff doesn't work. <laughs> and so why would I continue to put investment into that so that I could do security theater and wash my hands of it? The reality is this is where our investments need to go. I want you all to know that during the budget proceedings, these will be the arguments that I'm making. When we're talking about the amendment process, this is where my amendments will likely be going. These are the kinds of things that I believe are really important. We under, under already as a society, under analyze, under, under treat, under identify, and overly uh, uh, castigate people who are dealing with mental health 
uh, issues. And so for me, this is a root cause of it. It is not the one all end all fix it. There are three of you for the entire district. I can't foresee how that works. Uh, but I understand how it works in the places and where you are touching children directly. And so I'm grateful to you all for doing that work. It is my hope that we elevate and amplify your work because I constantly hear about how this stuff doesn't work. So we got to go back to that other stuff that didn't work and we've never given this a proper chance. And anybody who pretends that we have is a liar. Anybody who says we've invested in this at the same amount can go look at the numbers. I'm willing to look at any data you want to look at. I'm willing to look at any numerical cost or whatever you want to look at, we have never actually invested or funded any of this to a degree where we can actually say, well, that's good. And what I have heard is that we need to ramp it up. So I want to address that really quickly too. Uh, the idea that this should, I know, I, got, I, see the, I see the time. So I just want to address this because I recognize that we are often asked for comments on this. And so this will live for eternity on the internet. And so what I want people to understand is we are often told that what we have to do is until this gets funded, we should just fund that other stuff. That's not how this works. We don't have infinite dollars. And so you have to make a choice. These are public safety decisions. These are school safety decisions. These are better whole student decisions. If you're going to fund that, then you're not going to fund this. If you're going to fund those things, then you have to figure out where that money's coming from. And I want to just be on record clearly that this is where I think we need to go. This is the work I think we need to do. I have seen it work. I have seen it been, be successful both in school settings, out of school settings, with adults, with youth. This is the direction I'd like to see BPS go in. This has my full support. I have no questions for you because I'm very up to date on all of the work you do. I'm grateful for you taking the time. Thank you, Councilor Mejia. Thank you, Councilor Lara. And thank you to Councilor Brayton and all my other counselors, colleagues who have been here to hear about this. Thank you, Councilor Arroyo, and thank you, Councilor Lara, for both being my co-sponsors on this issue and, be, and bringing it as you will. Um, and, and I hope as BPS continues, to, as we continue to go through the budget season, I think that it's important for us to always assume best intentions is that what we really want to do is make sure that you guys are set up for success. But we can only do that if we understand what you're grappling with and the ways that we can help support fill in those gaps. So the more vulnerable you are in this space and the more explicit you are about what your needs are, the better we can advocate for you. This is what collaboration is about. Jillian, and I'm glad that you named it because I am really trying to restore um, and repair the harm, right? Because I think that it takes us modeling that behavior for us to get there as well. So I'm going to move on to um, my next colleague, Councillor Breeden, then followed by Councillor Murphy, uh, Councillor Flynn, then Councillor Flaherty. So Councillor Breeden, you now have the floor and five minutes. Oh, well, thank you, man. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you all for this very, very important uh, conversation this afternoon. Um, I, I really do believe in this uh, restorative practices and restorative justice as a way, a really positive and constructive way to go forward. And sadly, we haven't invested enough in it in the past, and hopefully we can correct that situation. And it's not just about putting money into it, but making sure that the money is, is targeted and well spent in a very thoughtful way that is, and, and that we get good um, good outcomes from it. Um, Superintendent Skipper uh, mentioned the idea that, you know, to make this really work, we have to saturate our schools. It has to be totally embedded in the school culture that, that restorative practices is, a, is, a, is, is the way we do things. And it's part of every day, every aspect of our day. And it's, it works as well in the staff room as it does in the classroom. So, you know, I think restorative practices, we all need to work. We all need to work on some of that in our relationships with our peers, no matter where we are in life. Um, so I, I was wondering, you know, my sense of it is that a lot of these practices, this sort of mindset that you're trying to develop has to start right in, you know, um, in preschool. And I'm wondering, I know we're very focused on the, on the older kids that are, are having severe challenges. But, you know, I, I think to make this really work and to saturate our schools with it, we have to we have to really start early so that the, the young uh, people we're working with come into school, uh, uh, progress through our school system with, with an ever increasing and uh, 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 competency in in restorative practice and how to how to manage their own stress and how to relate to others etc so i'd just like to get your sense of 
saturating our schools and how we're going to get there. Jillian might be the one to answer that question. Yeah, so I think, you know, part of it is in, most of it is in the implementation plan that I was speaking about, which is we have to have both in school um, staff who are the, you know, know their buildings best. Um, it is also very important for our school-based staff to have district folks to lean on that are specifically there to support them in restorative practices work. Um, so it's a two-prong approach in this saturation, um, which just makes me laugh because Mary and I laughed about the word saturate before. I was like, is it too much? Is it not too much? But it is what we want to do. Okay. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's sort of a, a, a top-down and a bottom-up um, you know, approach to this, because if we want to have something live in schools every day in every classroom, we have to ensure that there's people at the building level who are experts in this work. Additionally, we also have to make it a district priority, which means that we have to create district positions that focus on this work and can lead the way at a balcony level on what needs to be done. That also includes paying attention to the metrics. And I mentioned this before, having um, a data and implementation specialist who can look at the numbers, who we're not just using, you know, qualitative data to lead this work. It has to be quantitative. Um, you know, and Councilor Arroyo spoke about this. We can't say that something hasn't worked or that it's not effective if we don't actually have um, real data to look at. And that's something that we have to commit to as we commit to this saturation process. Yeah, I think the, the data point, and, and I think it's almost like you can, if, if you're watching the data and you've got good, you've got a good understanding of where things are, and, and then if you see there's a need for more intervention in a certain school or with a certain grade or a certain group, that you can, you can apply resources and, and back back up the folks on the ground who maybe need more support, you know. Um, the other question I had really was thinking about, you know, we have, we have um, in some of our schools have gone to, um, you know, um, sent, making seventh and eighth grade part of the high, into, into rolling it into a high school. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, post pandemic, and well, it's not, we're not really post pandemic yet. It was sort of coming out of it, but we're not there yet. Um, you know, the incredible disruption of the pandemic, and then we have, we've made some shifts with uh, grades and, and schools, and, you know, I, I think that transition from sort of elementary school to high school is always challenging. And, you know, just thinking about it, are, are there, do you see more problems in that, with that transition at the moment? Like, is that, is, is, is that, I, I always think that those middle school years are incredibly difficult for any of us as we, if we have, sort of, I don't really want to think back to what I was like at that age but you know I think targeting having an understanding of when 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 our young people are having the most challenge and then sort of anticipating the challenges and then giving the tools to handle with it before they arrive at the at the at the moment when they need to have those skills I see Jody nodding <laughs> Thanks, Councillor Braden. Um, you know, we know that middle school is very difficult. Excuse me, I'm sorry. <laughs> Phone's mm -hmm. going off. Um, that middle school is different, uh, difficult for all students. I mean, I remember just to your point, I remember being 12 and oh my God, it was the most horrible time, 12 and 13 in my life. Um, so we expect that. I think your question specifically about the transition um, into high school for the for the middle school students, it's really too early right now to make a determination because behavior across the district, we, we've just seen troubling behavior across the district and actually, you know, throughout the country. So it's hard to know if, if it's the 7 to 12 model that's problematic or is it the fact that, that students miss two years of school? That's and then yeah, so, so, you know, I think it's a really good question and we'll find out, you know, we'll, we'll look at that over time, but, um, but I, I, I agree that we need to really pour more resources into, into the middle school students who we know need it the most. 
And I just wanted to follow up about your your point of embedding this in in the elementary grades in even the preschool. And you know, it's just it's uh, it, it's such a great point because what we need, what we know, is that we have to provide students with a language from the very beginning, right? We want we want to help them understand what we're what our expectations are, and we start young, we start small, and then we build over time. So yeah. um, I I really appreciate your your bringing that up, and I think that the model that Chief Kelton was talking about includes all of the schools. So, you know, it will be varied levels depending on um, the, the grade and the support that's necessary. Very good. I, I, I worked in uh, for some years in a, in a, in a, in a in, with special ed and 16 years at Perkins School for the Blind and oh, nice. those readiness skills, those very early readiness skills, it's, it's sort of, I feel that that's part of the language and the skill sets that you're trying to build. And I see a uh, Madam Chair is waving her <laughs> so yeah, I have to really, stop. Yeah, thank you, I'm Madam not... Chair. And thank you for allowing me to um, ask my questions. And thank you for your very thoughtful answers. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Councillor Breeding, for your grace. It's really hard to um, do these uh, hearings and try to keep things moving and making sure that everybody feels fully expressed. So I did want to note that I saw, Jenna, your hand was up, and I want to be super mindful of that and wanted to know if you, um, I know that Councillor Breeden's time is up, but I'm more than welcome to have you answer or, or, or reflect on anything that you heard from Councillor Breeden. So please. Thank, thanks, Councillor. I really just wanted to answer your question about the young kids Jody started and to let you know that we are invested in working with Universal Pre-K. And so we now have a social worker that is dedicated to Universal Pre-K is really working on those skills and a family liaison uh, that just started uh, this past week. And so we are really committed to starting them even before they have to, to start school. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for that. So I'm going to ask a few questions and then I'm going to um, create an opportunity for Councillor, my, I know Councillor Lara has uh, some follow-up questions that I want to make sure that we create space for that. Um, but I'm going to start off a little bit different, you know, in the spirit of just trying to model what I believe is real collaborative work. I'm just curious from, um, just because there's always been so much tension between advocates and administration and families. And so just curious from, um, um, from an advocate's standpoint, when we think about this conversation and when we think about repairing the harm, what can we be modeling right now in terms of effective strategies for how we um, begin to, to enter into that relationship? And I'm going to ask Edith, you know, to, um, to share and also um, Iman to maybe start off with you, Iman, since you had the, have You've done a lot of work in the school to prison pipeline space. And then I know, Edith, you from a cultural responsive lens in terms of kind of like what can we be doing more of? Would love to, to get some insight. So, Ian, you now have the floor. Thank you so much. Um, I think one of the biggest things that we see is a disconnect between what we hear from our from the children and from the parents and what Boston Public Schools says that they are committed to and what they're doing, especially when it comes to the world of disciplinary hearings. So it might be really beautiful, and, and I love sharing space with Jody and Dacia. The, we imagine what the perfect practice is, and unfortunately, when I'm in the space with your councils that are protecting the school district and have an obligation to advocate for the school district, the reality of those spaces are very disconnected from how you envision disciplinary hearings should happen and also how you envision the information is shared with parents. Unfortunately, the vast majority of parents that call us are, are not aware that alternatives should be used before pushing them into um, the pushing them out of schools in long term and now short term suspensions. And so what I'm hearing, and this is why I'm so thankful that you brought us all together. Um, what I'm hearing is that there's a disconnect between you and between your legal team that enforces the commitments that you have made or also for, and really goes more by enforcing the law. And so the reason why we as advocates are pushing for change in law is because the commitments you have made as a school district are very different from the ways that your legal team shows up when it comes to pushing children out. So I think the best way of bridging that distrust between your parents and your team is by making sure that you build a stronger communication between the reality of what your legal team does when they are pushing out children. 
Thank you for that. And I, I, I also would just say that, you know, I think language is also very triggering. Um, punitive language, sometimes we don't even realize that when we write a letter, I know I've, I've received letters from Mona Lisa's school that makes me feel like, oh, you know, when she was younger, when she had to sign in, it's mandated, or, you know, we haven't heard back from you. I mean, just even things as simple as that can really change the way somebody experiences their interaction with the system. So I think that there's some stuff that we could just do initially just to kind of shift the culture that feels a little bit more embracing of the community that we are in, right? So. So thank you for, for bringing that up. I'm going to go to Edith. I know Edith, you know, as the president, as the former president of BEAM and somebody who has been in the district and has always fought for culturally responsive pedagogy and the way we show up in this world. Can you just talk a little bit more about, like, some, some lessons that you think on the advocate side that would help the district as they move forward in this work? Well, first of all, thank you, Councilor Mejia. I'd like to say that restorative justice comes from African and indigenous cultures. And I would argue with the position that we are talking about restorative practices because restorative justice is a framework to look at institutions, policies, and also systems that harm our students. And we know that these systems are racialized and it is about access and who gets opportunity. And so if we're talking about restorative justice, the framework of it, we need to interrogate what has done harm to Black and Latino students so that they are not getting the access, so they are in this pipeline. Because they don't choose this pipeline, the systems push them into this pipeline by willful policies that replicate unfair and unjust practices over and over. So when you talk about we are using restorative practices and we don't really reframe how systems are constructed, and how policies are designed that will provide racial equity. Uh, there's a book by uh, Fania E. Davis that I would encourage you to read. It's called Racism and Restorative Justice. Um, Fania is the daughter of Angela Davis. And I would argue that you are using the Australian whitewashed version of restorative justice. And if you really look at the emergence of this concept, it came from African and indigenous people, and BPS needs to stop hiding behind how we re how when students are harmed by the systems that don't change, we will never get to restorative justice. And that's the piece that has to change, um, as Councilor Arroyo mentioned, that we have to talk about how black students are going through metal detectors, and why are we spending $30 million on surveillance, and why are we talking about going back to school policing when we know that that harms Black and Latino students, particularly males who have stopped coming to school, and Black families who are leaving the district in higher and higher numbers. This trajectory will not change until we sit with those folks who are impacted. Representation matters. We need to sit down with those of us who have experienced this system, who have been harmed by these systems and continue to come back to impact change in these systems, because that's where the solution lies. It lies with students, it lies with families, and it lies with communities whose experiences have been different from yours, who have not um, gone through the developmental process of, oh, I'm a teenager, I'm gonna do something that's harmful. But if you're black, you're gonna end up in jail. If you're white, you get a pass, and you end up in an exam school because of the way systems look at you. So. We have to talk about race. If we do not talk about race and racism and these embedded policies that continue to harm Black and Latino students, then we will be in the same place and we will, we will still have these problems. That's right. That's right. And, and I, I'm so incredibly encouraged, right, that we're all here having the same conversation and walking into the space recognizing that this is our moment to seize. And how we move forward and the investments that we make and the narratives that we choose to uplift, it is what's going to get us there. And the accountability to Leon's question earlier, I'd like to see the return on investments and the metrics of how we are going to measure success across the district in every school. 
And that, to me, that level of accountability is what this moment is calling for. Um, and so I really do appreciate um, our partners that are here you know, joining us as we continue to figure all of these things out. I think that it is important for me to also uplift that, you know, um, I'm just curious about the difference between coordinators and coaches. There's, there's, I, I, if Jillian, if you could just talk to me about, you know, what is the difference between, uh, you had mentioned uh, hiring coordinators and coaches. Can you just give me the, a little bit of understanding of how these two roles differ? And I'm also curious about author. Um, I've heard of him, I've heard of his work, and I'm wondering why author is not a part of this conversation if he's a part of making these things happen. And I think that that level of disconnect is what I'm hearing Edith name is like folks who, who are doing the work and have a, a different understanding, not having a seat at the table, um, for me is, is, is definitely not the type of behavior that I want to replicate in the hearings that I host. So can somebody talk to me about that, please? So I, I will start to talk about the part of the difference between a coordinator and a coach. So, you know, we're still working through job titles, but in my mind, the coordinator would be school-based and the coach would be the district physician. Just for like a very simplistic answer to that. Counselor, does that work for you? Isn't Yeah, I mean, I mean, we only have three coaches. Is that what I'm hearing? And then we the have right now we yes, yeah, three coordinators positions. Have... Sorry, say that again. How many coaches? We don't have any coaches right now. That's the problem. Okay. So that that's what I'm trying to get at, right? So how are we going to right. So that's part of the implementation plan is right this like budget ask to create these district positions for each region and then additionally have a school based liaison. So I think you know is there I don't, a difference in pay because I'm just I'm just I'm yes. just trying to So the position is different. So I mean I guess I'm not like trying to be like evasive or not answer your question but I also want to be transparent that I'm like we haven't posted these job descriptions yet, um, but I am developing them and I have the implementation plan. So the thought is similar to how we have district social workers or an operational leader for each region. We would have, for the purpose of this conversation, let's call it a restorative justice coordinator for each region. Then at the school level, we would have a restorative justice or a restorative practices liaison at the building level. So I would recommend that we have uh, folks like Arthur and the BTU Restorative Justice Committee and some of our advocates. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We got, we, yeah, that's that's part of this whole process. Who are informing you what these job descriptions are going to Yep could look like and how you're going to define success. Um, because I think pay scale is, is as a part of that is, is, is just as equally as important. Um, mm -hmm. So I want to just offer that. And I, I want to get to my counselor colleague. I didn't, I forgot to put my timer on. I'm, I know I'm beyond my time too, but the only thing that I would like to just offer before I transition back to counselor Lara is that, you know, Rita mentioned this whole conversation around community. And I think a lot of our advocates here have also uplifted the important role that community plays. And I think that working with parents and helping them understand what, what this looks like and very explicitly, what are your rights in terms of navigating through this process is part of the communication plan. And I think that that's something where I feel like some of it gets shortchanged. And I also don't think it should be just the district's responsibility when we're thinking about restorative justice practices. I also think that there's an opportunity to include the Maverick Landons, also include the um, hair salons and where you're getting your hair cut. Because let me just tell you, we could run circles there. 45 minutes while you're getting your hair done, we can fix some issues, right? Looking at how we even set up these bathrooms, um, the community uh, academy students, I met with them not too long ago, and they gave me a brilliant idea. They want funding to redesign their bathrooms so that they can be a little more lounges. And instead of dealing with bochinche, which is a little gossip, they would like to just sit there and, and have a space where they can talk about the issues that they're 
um, experiencing as friends, right? Like there's like so many ways for us to really resolve conflict um, that I, I, I just, I just want to enter that into the record for us to consider, to think outside the box. But I'm going to go to my colleague, Counselor Lada, who is a practicing um, restorative justice um, expert um, and is deeply committed to restorative justice practice as a way for us to deal with our um, the issues of violence. So I'm going to kick it back to you, Counselor Lada. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you all for all of your um, answers and all of your work, and Edith for grounding us in the reality of where this practice comes from. I learned RJ um, from black and brown elders in my community, but when I was um, trying to implement it more broadly, particularly in schools, because that's what I, that is what I wrote my thesis on, um, I learned from elders like Maladoma Somme and those folks who, you know, are not like with us, but the, in, it's an Afri in, in the African, indigenous African tradition. Um, so thank you for, anchoring us in that conversation and for anchoring me and reminding me <laughs> of what I'm doing here. Um, I, this, so like I, like I mentioned before, I was a peer mediator when I was in high school and it was something that was incredibly transformative. I went to English high school, the principal and the teachers there were really, really committed and open to just trying different things, right? To just like, if something was happening, looking for an alternative, everybody got really creative and we had a really vibrant, and cohesive school community um, when I was there. Uh, and so I'm curious about the involvement of students. How are you involving students in the development and the implementation of the restorative justice practices in the schools? And how are you looking at peer mediation and the implementation and the training of students? I think I have the same questions about, are, do you have any students that are trained? Are, you know, I know that the BTU, restorative justice, like organizing committee that they, you know, made a recommendation around a course. And so what is happening with the young people? I know that we've talked about top down and I think that that's correct because you can't get anything done in a school community if you don't have the support of the principal kind of like implement, like, you know, demand, like making sure that everybody knows that this is what we're doing. And also it needs to be bottom up and bottom up means families. It means students, it means parents. And so how are you, doing? What is the bottom-up strategy? Jillian, I'm going to defer to you, um, if you don't mind. I mean, I, so I'm texting right now with Corey McCarthy, who we just, I just hired as the assistant superintendent of student development and advancement, who is specifically tasked with developing our peer mediation program and expanding our mentorship program. Um, and also deeply connected to that is our um, Boston Student Advisory Council. So they're a very important part of planning this and also being a part of student voice. But beyond that, we also realize that BSEC can't always be representative of every student voice. So this all goes back to the importance of developing in-school relationships and part of what is at the core of restorative practices is developing relationships with those in our community um, and developing relationships that um, allow for two-way communication that is um, productive and at times healing. So, you know, that is, that's paramount for this, for this implementation to work is that we have to allow student voice to be a part of it. And I think, I know that Corey's position is going to elevate that and make it an integral part of this implementation process. No, me mola baja. Sorry, I have two, I have two little, Nieces and nephews coming up the stairs. I got to redirect them. Give me one second. Consulata, can you take over? Ask one more question, please. Sorry, I'm back. I had to go open up the door for two little ones. So can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Consulata, did you get your answers? I had. Did 
did I lose control, Lara? I went downstairs and all of this, I come back up and what have I missed here? Did you guys kick Consolata off my Zoom? Asking those tough questions, Jillian, you couldn't handle it? Okay. I did, I answered. Okay, just wanna make sure. Um, so I, I do have some quick questions and they, they may make you feel a little bit kind of like I'm just, I really wanna have a better understanding of author. If somebody could just give me an example and tell me, you know, um, why isn't he here? Go ahead, Jody. Um, I can't speak specifically about why he isn't here. What I can say is that Arthur's role, he worked very closely with, um, with Suffolk and he also worked with Succeed Boston for a number of years. Um, so at Succeed Boston, we have had all of our staff trained and they're also um, trainers in restorative practices. Um, so so um, we've worked collaboratively with, with um, Arthur, Henry, and Brenda um, to talk about, to, to, along with the NIJ folks, to develop a plan of implementation. Um, as I said at the last hearing, I mean at the, at the pre-meeting that we had, unfortunately the implementation around the NIJ grant was flawed. And so um, one of the things that we were hoping was that we were going to get a rollout plan from that NIJ grant. Does everyone remember that when I mentioned that last time? And, um, and we didn't get a rollout plan. So, um, so that kind of set us back in terms of where we were going. And Arthur and Brenda and Henry were all waiting also. We were all waiting for this, for this rollout, this district-wide rollout plan and thinking about what the cost would be and also looking at, at um, the implementation. So I can just talk, tell you that, that he, he has been part of a district-wide team. There's a large group of, of people in BPS, as I said, who who are trained in restorative practices. Yeah. See, I, I think that that is part of the, the, the process, right? I, I think that we have a amazing opportunity now with a new administration, a new superintendent. You know, this is my first term as the education chair. Um, so I just think there's a lot of opportunities here for us to really think outside the box in terms of supporting the work. And the best way for us to be supportive is, is if we can be vulnerable, if we could be honest, like we, and also if we could be super intentional about making sure that those who are doing the work and living the realities are also in this space, informing us and participating in the decision-making process, right? Because the model um, that I'm hearing um, from those who have practiced, you know, it, it has to be, everyone has to be invested. And that includes from the top, all the way down to the implementation. And so it's about, it's like utilizing, it's like going to the gym, y'all. I don't know if you remember in the January, everybody's like going to the gym every day and by, you know, third week of January, you're lucky if you go to the gym twice a week, right? It's about, it's about flexing that muscle and using it every single day. That's the only way we're gonna be able to really be effective is that we're using it and doing it with fidelity. Um, so I just I just want to name that, and I and I think that it's important um, that we are also accountable, um, and that we're starting off with a benchmark. You know, I'd love to know here um, how many schools across the district can we say are utilizing restorative justice uh, with fidelity? How many? With fidelity, that's the question, right? I think that that's, that's the elephant in the room. You know, there were 30 schools that participated in the NIJ grant and they were, um, you know, what, what we heard from, from the research, it was a research project, is that implementation was flawed. So can we say that any of those schools are implementing with fidelity? I'm not sure. Um, I would say that there are some schools who have been involved in restorative justice and using restorative practices for a very long time. 
Um, Trinity has worked across the district, for instance, and they were, they've were they been involved for a long time at the McCormick BCLA. Um, so I would say that that is a place to look, although I can't speak specifically that they are um, implementing with fidelity. And, and I do think that as Chief Kelton said, part of our implement implementation plan is to look at what our school's doing, right? To identify which schools are doing what, and then to develop some, um, a way in which we can assess whether or not, um, whether or not they are implementing with fidelity. Yeah, I, I'm just gonna name another elephant in the room in terms of just the level of, you know, the, the, the restorative justice practice was um, implemented in 2013, I believe it was, right? It's part of like the mandate and now it's 10 years and we're having this conversation. And then none of you all were, I don't know if, how many of you all were here then, but it's just, it's, it's frustrating, I think, and this is probably why, you know, we're having this conversation right now. And I wanna make sure that we don't replicate bad behavior. So we're starting off at 2023 level setting, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that that is where we need to be, is where we, we're starting off with where we are right now and where do we wanna be and what's it gonna take for us to get there? That's why we're having this hearing right now. Mm -hmm. And we would not be having this hearing um, if someone did not ask me the question that I did not have the answer to. Um, which was uh, Tanisha Sullivan, who's the president of the NAACP, asked me about specifically the code of conduct, restorative justice practice, and has anyone done a deeper dive in terms of evaluating mm -hmm. the successes? Mm -hmm. And that's why we're here, mm -hmm. right? So we're, we're starting off with some data and trying to figure out where we're going to be. And I think we should, we should do a slow grow. What mm -hmm. are some goals that we have for the next three months? Mm -hmm. the next six months and then, you know, the outcome. And I, I, I just don't think in terms of planning, um, it sounds like we're going to be kicking this thing off and having everyone trained by the summer to start off the next school year. Is that what I heard you say, Jillian? So that, that includes principals, staff, that includes like, can you just give me like, what, what, what does that entail? In terms of- I mean, that's our hope is, that's what I am pushing to have happen. Okay. And what do you need to help you make that happen? And then I know Jenna, you had your hand up. I'll go stay. I'll go to you. I mean, I think the you know the superintendent is really committed to this. I think that's a huge help. I think you know the struggle, and I said this early on in this conversation. I think the struggle is. You know, there's so much teachers often feel that like, and I, you know, that there's so much on their plate that they're already doing so much. And I don't want, you know, and I see Edith, you know, shaking her head and I agree, like that can't be a barrier to what work really needs to be done. Yep. Okay. I, I, I appreciate that. Can I say why I was shaking my head since you named me? Yes, go ahead. I was, I was not shaking my head because- Oh, I, I was agreeing with you, I'm sorry. I was not agreeing with you. I think teachers want to be effective. We are losing yes. our teachers because they don't have the support. We have to ask the question, when an initiative is uh, adopted, what is the impact on classroom practice? What is mm -hmm. the impact on supporting teachers? Because teachers support students. And so as we support teachers, students are supported. So I don't believe that we can say teachers are doing too much. You know, is it too much or is it, you know, like yeah. working hard and working effectively is different. Yes. This is yes. A, like, restorative justice will help with teachers in the conversation, the dialogue, the exchange with students, empowering students and teachers collectively is part of the work of restorative justice. And so I think if you say this is another layer, no, it's not. And I, where are the teachers to talk about this and so that they can share with you what their challenges are. Professional development needs to be provided in a research and evidence-based way. And restorative justice is about being proactive, preventative, and, and, and problem solving before things become a problem. 
So it, it, it's not about community engagement. It's about building community in classrooms and throughout the school so that there is a learning community. And how do we do this work together? Coming out of the pandemic with our traumas that are just as invisible as the virus that we all suffered from and many of our relatives and citizens died from. We need to talk about the invisibility of trauma. We need to give students words for it. We need to give teachers language for it. So I don't think this is layering teachers with something else. This is becoming effective and responsive to what is needed in order to make students who come into schools with the trauma not knowing how to talk about it feeling unsafe. That's mental health issues. Trauma is what makes students feel unsafe. And restorative practices say, what are the policies that need to change? What are the structures that need to change? What are the procedures and practices that need to change? What are the systems that need to change to connect with students and for teachers to be successful? And, and so I think we need a conversation with teachers in terms of adopting practices that are gonna help them become more effective with their students because they are traumatized just as the students are. Yes, you know, I, I hope that- um, Can I, sorry. Jillian, I will go to you. I just wanted to note that I, I, it's, that I haven't called on Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Murphy or Councillor Flynn, not because I haven't wanted to, but because they left earlier on during the hearing. So I just I just want to note for the record, in case anyone's wondering why I have not called on my other colleagues, is that they are no longer here. So I just wanted to note that for the record because I have just kept going on and on and on and on and on and haven't moved on besides me and Councilor Lada. So I just want to name that for the record. Um, Jillian, you could respond to Edith and then I'm going to uh, open it up for our public hearing and, and oh, give good. you opportunity to do closing remarks. Just want to be super mindful of time. Jillian. Yeah, I just want to say that I, Edith, I, you know, wholeheartedly agree with everything that you're saying. And I think the place where we struggle as a district and where restorative justice and can lose its effectiveness is that this can't be thought of as just another layer. It can't be thought of as just an initiative. Like this is the work. This is, to your point, what will make community and connection with our young people. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't know what the word is that I'm looking for, but I mean, I just wanna say that I, I think that this work is paramount to creating inclusive educational environments that allow our students um, to be successful and to progress and to feel safe and to be trauma informed and to be healing spaces. So I, I agree. Okay, guys, I just have to say, you know, I know that the administration, whenever they have to send people to my hearings, they like are always freaking out because I'm so unorthodox and I just do things the way that my heart tells me to, because normally we don't have the back and forth with, Everyone, it's always the counselors ask all the questions and that's the end. But I really do believe that in order for us to get to where we need to be, everybody needs to have a seat at the table and everybody needs to be fully expressed. Mm -hmm. So I do appreciate Chantel um, and, and Annie being um, mindful that I am trying to shift the way we do business because only this is the only way I really do believe that we can get to where we all wanna get to and that is together. And so I really do appreciate the back and forth that happens here, even though when it does feel a little bit tentious, you know, I think that's good. And, and I think we all want the same thing. And the question is, is as a council, our job is to help you all get there. And Jillian, I just want to acknowledge how incredibly refreshing it is to have a chief who sits in this space and is willing to be vulnerable um, and, and and willing to enter these spaces, knowing that we're gonna come at you, right? Knowing that we're gonna push you, knowing that we want you to be the best that you can. And, that, and the only way you could do that is by listening to people who know what it's like to be on the other side of this, whether it be the parents, the, the lawyers, the advocates, like we got you. And if you experience it with that, 
then you're going, we're all going to get to where we need to be. I just, I just want to, I just want to end with you understanding that our intention is to really help support the district because if we don't, our kids are the ones that are going to suffer. Mm -hmm. I walk into stores and I've been followed. I mean, so from when I was a kid till now, you do not realize how traumatizing it is to be a person of color having to navigate spaces for those folks who are tuning in and, uh, and don't understand why we're so harping on the fact that metal detectors and all these other punitive things is because it does have a long-term impact as adults when you are constantly being watched and criminalized. I walk into a store and I'm like, I'm not gonna steal anything, y'all. Y'all don't need to follow me. Like that is the, the, the type of environment that we create. When... Counselor, I appreciate you. So I appreciate I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> Did I My get out? I just said I appreciate you. Yeah. Um, I I appreciate all y'all. I really do. Yeah. Um, I'll give you an opportunity for closing and then I'm gonna open it up for public testimony. Jenna, Ian. How about, how about I just answer some of the questions that didn't get um, just, and then we can close out. You can stop me, Councilor Mejia, if I'm talking too much, but did want to give you just uh, some of the work that is currently being done and name some of the schools. Um, we do have some schools that have um, uh, RJ positions as part of their job descriptions. And so our, our small but mighty team, as we call them, you're right, it is a small team. Um, are working on training whole schools. So some of those are Boston Day and Evening, Community Academy, Dearborn, Mary Lyons, Horace Mann. Those are trainings that they've done. We have trained students at Tech Boston, seventh and eighth grade to uh, the other Councillor Braden's uh, question about the younger kids, including them in the work. Um, so we have done consultation with the Henderson, Brighton, King, Higginson, Lewis, Madison Park, uh, Boston Day and Evening, the hub schools coordinators are trained. Um, we are working to uh, even train the safety specialists along with uh, central office employees to make sure that we are really uh, training across the board. We are doing, um, as you know, there has been a lot of issues and concerns in schools. And so we are uh, utilizing the team in conjunction with the social workers and school staff to do harm and healing circles. Um, I also just wanted to point out, uh, we actually use Vanya Davis's book. We have uh, indigenous uh, staff. Uh, we sometimes use an outside person that does the training, um, but we, we do recognize what the practice is and uh, really you, that we do utilize practitioners that know how to uh, train and uh, implement restorative practices. Uh, so that's really, I just wanted to, wanted you to know what, what is happening and to make sure that, you know, we also would welcome if uh, counselors or other members of the community want to uh, check in with the team or see what it's like in schools that, as Jody mentioned, we, uh, we would welcome that. Thank you, Jenna. Thank you. Um, so... I want to ask, and um, Ian, I love your shirt. I see you prepping yourself. Just wanted to know if you have like a one minute little closing room. I know this is so unorthodox, but I'm giving everybody an opportunity to be fully expressed here. Ian, any last words of encouragement or wisdom that you'd like to share? And then I'm gonna go to Edith, um, and then I'm gonna go to public testimony. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, as I stated earlier, the law has changed since November 8th that it is in effect and alternatives have become more important than ever. Um, my worry is that there is a disconnect between the information sharing between Boston Public Schools and the parent units and the students who are unaware of their rights. And I would like to know one, how to bridge that gap as quickly as possible. Unfortunately, the guidance by Desi just came live last week. So Desi also dropped the ball on that. It's effective November 8th. The guidance should have been two districts way earlier, but that's besides the point. What we want to know as advocates is why is it that we are the first 
line of information when it comes to critical laws and critical rights that every student has in the state of Massachusetts. That worries me as an advocate. And so I'm throwing that out there, that the information deficit changes the way parents can advocate for their children, and it changes the way children think about themselves in your system. I'm just putting that out there. Thank you so much for this space. Edith, Rita, Jody, everyone has a voice on my hearing, just so you know. Final words, I'd just like to say that we, as we sit here in Black History Month, we have to do better. We have to acknowledge not only the suffering, but the contributions of Black and Brown folks in the building of this country. And the restorative practices have to be rooted in having a reflection of our cultures in the policies, the structures, the practices and the procedures that happen in schools that educate our children. There has to be an infrastructure of racial equity first. And if we are going to close gaps, and I would call it an education debt because our students are old in education. I throw myself in the mix from so long ago. There are things that BPS has not changed. And one thing that has, it has not changed through its policies is the racialized policies that disenfranchises our students, our black and brown students. Our students are not marginalized. Systems are marginalized. They are marginalized and the resources are hoarded for a certain population that does not look like me. Restorative justice about, is about dismantling racist structures and recreating and redesigning because we know schools were not meant for us. These schools in Boston have been named after slaveholders, uh, those who were eugenicists like Louis Agassiz, thank goodness that school is closed, the McKinley School. The, these individuals represented places of learning that were designed for people who don't look like me. And so if we are going to change that, we have to change policy, not just respond with practices that try to make students feel better about unfair policies. The policies themselves have to change, school structures have to change, and they have to open up and build and reflect those who it's educating. And there are very few students who are not black and brown in Boston, but I have not seen a shift. And restorative practices have to be embedded in uh, curriculum, in hiring, in everything, in funding formulas, in everything that is done in schools so that Black students and Latino students have an equal chance or an equitable chance at attending a high achieving school, exam schools, taking AP courses and graduating prepared to go to college. And, and that is what restorative practice is about, changing systems. Uh, restorative justice is about changing systems and creating that infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Edith. I, um, unless anyone else has anything else to say, I just wanted to um, just think, oh, I see Rita's hand up. Yeah, I just so waiting for um, testimony. Ethan, if you could just start lining people up for public testimony, those who are scheduled to speak, just so that you have two minutes um, per testimony. Okay, Rita, you now have the floor. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just wanted to, to say that, um, you know, the, the the system that has, this system, this BPS system that has created these inequitable racist policies, uh, it, it can't, the solutions can't be created within that system. I think what BPS has never done well is created, is creating a collaborative ecology where you have, you're working with systems outside of that system that do understand this work well and that can be guiding and that can lead to meaningful change. I, you know, it's like that Albert Einstein quote, like you, you can, I, I forget the quote exactly, but it's something the effect of, you know, the, the system that created the problem can create the solution. <laughs> so that's all I had to say. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Any other? Okay. Y'all are gonna, every, I'm gonna spoil everybody who's here. They're gonna be like, Councilor Mejia's um, hearings are always very um, 
spicy. Um, <laughs> but I, I just, I just, I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. So you gotta go on mute, Linda. Go on mute, Linda. Go on mute. Let, don't, you're not ready yet. I, um, I, I just want to say thank you to the administration. Thank you to the advocates. Thank you so much for bringing your full selves into the space. Um, and, and thank you for allowing us to facilitate it in this way. I am going to now transition over to um, the public testimony, knowing that this is the testimony system committee, um, and we're gonna continue to move through the conversation um, and some recommendations. So I'm gonna move on to our next one, and that's going to be, Linda, if you can get your audio situation under control. You now have the floor. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. You know, there's a number of things I'd like to say, but first, I just represent the um, BTU Restorative Justice Organizing Committee. It's a pleasure to be here. It's been difficult to hear some of the things I've heard. Um, but you know, I have to say, Art, the fact that Arthur Collins is not a part or was not invited or you were not aware of him, makes a glaring statement about um, how restorative BPS really is. He's been the point person for a while. His office doesn't have a budget and minimal staff. And so, you know, I think the real question is, is Boston really committed to this? The number of us who've been in the school system doing this work since 2007, done tremendous work, and we've never been at the table. So, so I don't know. The um, restorative, the restor restorative um, committee has provided a list of recommendations to the super for the superintendent. We met with Jessica Tang. We gave that to them. Um, but the bot the bottom line is, you know, there've been people doing a hard work, dedicated, passionate people, um, and this has really been difficult because the kind of Regard, like the answer that you got, why Arthur's not here, that's not legitimate. How could he not have been someone from the school system not have him at that table? It makes a statement. Um, but we appreciate you hosting this forum. We look forward to working with you. Um, and there are people who've been here, again, since 2007 doing this work. And we are committed and passionate. Um, and we're just thankful that you hosted this and your co-host. Um, so we look forward to um, to talking more about how we can really make this happen beyond the um, beyond where it is now. And I'll close with this. There is something systemically wrong with where we are at this point, systemically. It doesn't make sense since 2007 and we're here now and the, it's still just disjoint, disjointed, that's a problem. And I heard a lot of words. I heard a lot of things. However, the bottom line is we're not where we should be. And the fact that, again, Arthur's is not at the table, doesn't have a budget. What statement does that make? So again, the um, Restorative Justice Organizing Committee is looking forward to um, working with councilmen and councilwomen to um, advance RJ. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to move on to our next um, testimony. And when you do, you just want to make sure that you um, say your name, um, your uh, your affiliation or the neighborhood that you represent, and you have two minutes. And this time I'm really gonna keep you all to task. Okay, Ethan, bring in the next. There's an uh, um, Adina Davidson, there is a L Mills, there is a Susan Lovett, just wanted to make sure, Ethan, if any of those folks are signed, 
for public testimony. And I also want, while we're waiting, to bring people in, wanted to just note that the students at the Henderson um, had to organize to uh, be heard. And I think there is something to be said about the repair and the harm that we need to do there so that we're modeling behavior and creating space for young people to feel expressed and, and heard. Um, that is such a unique opportunity for us to lean into that. So, Adina, I, I know you. You used to go to all my seat plans. Hi, can you hear me? Go ahead. You have the wow. floor. Listen, I've been on the edge of my seats. I just got to say, it's a bit of a bumpy ride because there's a lot of painful stuff here, obviously, from every, you know, but it feels like this was a real conversation. And we all showed up. I'm, oh, I should say, I'm Adina Davidson. I, I, I work through Trinity. There was one of the organizations Jody mentioned at the Deborah McCormick and have been part from what we've been mentioning is from out of harm's way when the Deltas were around, that was working at the Curly and, then, and that was creating a, a restorative justice um, space. Anyway, what I'm saying is it's been, and, and now here, and I think that there are a lot of people who would want to do more of this if they didn't feel like they had to make a choice between this and everything else that they have to do. That's, that's a very simplistic way to say it. It's a sense of tools being taken away, even if they weren't great tools, and nothing has replaced it. And so there's a sense of, of panic of, hmm, it's, it feels futile to a lot of people. And, and competing wonderful initiatives, all these great ideas that are just stacked on top of each other and it doesn't feel possible to live them. So I don't, I don't you know, th this isn't the night for necessarily answers. Um, I think it's, it's been very clear that I've been just so heartened, oh my God, from people that are in, in the government, to um, to the community, to agencies, to legal, to to the boss, you know, all of the all of us. I just don't, I want to close the door and not let us out till we hammer some of the things out. And also, you know, Jillian talking about wraparound and just the idea of we need each other. We need in a very large way, in a deep way, to see the value of 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 working together. So it's not simple, but I feel this conversation, um, I feel backed. I feel like I'm not gonna go back to a meeting tomorrow, a circle keeper meeting at a school that has not been able to bring it. A little bit we've been able to, but can you believe it? How does that happen? That it's so hard, it would be pushing against what, what people feel they need to do. So anyway, I, I appreciate you. I appreciate the invitation and um, we'll show up. I, I, I mean, we're part of the, the Restorative Justice Organizing Committee. There's a number of us here. So um, yeah, can you see that we are? Um, Let's see. And, and, yeah. And I wanna be so mindful I, to our, the two minute mark. As long as, 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 as I want to be encouraging for you all to keep on talking, I know that BPS no, has no. but we do thank you. the two minute um, point. Thank you so much for your patience and, and waiting to, to speak. And I appreciate your testimony. Um, Jillian, did you feel like you're going to talk after public testimony? Okay, girl, go ahead. No, 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 no. I was just saying, I don't, I, I don't want to be rude, but I have to go get my kids from aftercare because they charge by the minute after five. No, so. I, I hear you. You can transition on the radio and listen to this on your way there so you can keep on listening just so you I know want there's ways now to, you don't have but you can listen and, and you can also watch the tape later so Jillian thank you so much for being with us and for staying as long as you did go get your kid I know what that's like thank you everyone okay. thank you I'm going to move on to uh Susan Lovett I believe that you um are next on our list and you have two minutes and the floor 
Hi, thank you, Councillor Mejia. Um, I'm not a constituent, but I'm a big fan of yours, and I really respect and um, appreciate you for holding this hearing. Um, so many wise, important, experienced um, voices telling us, um, telling some of us what we already know and others of us what we need to hear. And I'm a social worker in BPS, and I um, have worked with the district for quite a long time, go way back with Adina, to the Out of Harm's Way grant. And I use restorative justice practices every day in my role, um, both with in classrooms, with leading circles, doing restorative conversations, consulting with admin on you know, some of our um, students who have externalizing behaviors that show up in the community that can cause harm. And um, we'd love to see a real investment in these practices from the district, like an investment that matches the need and um, that reflects what we have all become aware of, the state of um, youth mental health. So as a, as a social worker who's worked with youth for 33 years, um, I'm not surprised by some of what the rest of the public is, is becoming aware of. Like I've been in these places to see the effects of trauma, um, the effects of poverty and racism, and so now I feel like the world might be seeing it. And um, we recently have an, an addition of social workers to the district, which is certainly part of the problem, um, part of the solution. But this this would be another part of really um, bringing the training in a way that is comprehensive and ongoing. And and I, through my years working with the district, had had multiple times where I was invited to a two-hour training on restorative justice, or a three-hour training, or even a day. And it really didn't—it really didn't um, do the practices justice, so to speak, because um, so much of it is an unlearning of what I learned growing up in America in public school systems about crime and punishment. And you know, so much of that is like just in my brain and body that it is a very long road to the undoing of that and the new learning that I need to do. And, and my gratitude towards African and indigenous peoples who who originated and shared this practice is immense because I um, could not have come to it otherwise with the upbringing I have as an American. So I'm just... Um, thinking that the training really needs to be much, but it needs to be very significant. And I see the countdown and I appreciate it. And I'll, um, one of our members is Jess madden Foco, who's um, or another restorative justice expert like Arthur Collins. She's also at the, a teacher at English High. She has a, a course that is many hours, multiple levels, um, lots of different media interaction. And I, I feel like, an, an, an investment from PBS in that really comprehensive training would do would go a long way. So thank you again for letting me speak, and we'd, we'd love to connect with you after this hearing for next steps. Absolutely, thank you, thank you. And I I forgot to set your timer off, so it went off just now. But um, but thank you. I'm curious if um, central staff, Cora or um, Ethan or someone from my team could let me know if we have other folks. I don't see. Anyone else here? I see attendees, but not. I don't see any hands up. Um, I do know that you know there's still an opportunity to submit a public testimony. You could still uh, sign up um, or submit them in writing, uh, and that and that would be also read and uh, recorded into the record. So I just wanted to make that make that note. And we were also hoping to have um, Paola served as our youth voice. Um, so I was really grateful to Rita for making sure that we had some youth representation. And I think to Councilor Lada's point, it is really important for us to understand that we need to have the whole community, um, not just bits and pieces of it um, as we continue to move through this conversation. Oh, I do see my good friend Ruby Reyes is in the building in the Zoom. Um, Ruby, if you're here to testify, I'm incredibly happy to see you. And I am going to set the timer and you also have two minutes. Um, so my name is Ruby Reyes and I'm the executive director of the Boston Education and Justice Alliance. And I just wanted to really highlight how important it is now that we're in budget season for the central office staff to really make financial commitments and staffing commitments 
to restorative justice. Um, you know, I think Jillian talked a little bit about, you know, implementing these positions in the fall and the social worker, um, Jenna talked a little bit about, you know, the work of social workers, but in reality, right, like RJ is about um, really setting healthy norms and cultures at school. And that happens from a leadership level and a school wide level. It isn't through, you know, one social worker being trained a couple times. Um, but really, you know, system-wide in terms of an entire school really embracing this cultural shift. And I just want to highlight how important it is for leadership to be creating that culture of, you know, putting their money where their mouth is. And so, you know, we've seen, and I think, you know, not just between you, Councilor Mejia, and Councilor Arroyo, and Councilor Lada, um, we would really like to see leadership in central office put their money where their mouth is around restorative justice practices. Um, you know, the commitments that have been made immediately around the $30 million to cameras, um, these 18 community connections positions, um, you know, these are, are commitments that were immediately made and rolled out and implemented, um, whereas school communities are still struggling and need to actually have things like restorative justice practices implemented. We have one teacher who shared with us that when they were <laughs> installing the cameras in her school, she thought they were fixing the internet, but they were not actually fixing the internet. They were instead implementing <laughs> these new cameras, right? So these immediate responses and financial investments are not matching up with actual necessities of, of school communities. So I just wanted to really reiterate that and, and hope that leadership really absorbs and embraces what was said here today, not just in their financial planning, but in their staffing. Thank you. Thank you, Ruby. Thank you. And I, you know, I remember testifying when I had to testify in the school committee and they would give us three minutes and we had so much to say. Um, and no, really, this is even to, even Robert's rules of laws and all this stuff, just like, listen, like, I really do hope you know that everything that people say in these spaces, we take to heart um, and, and value the wisdom that exists um, in, in these opportunities that we have to build with each other. The question I always have to ask myself is when we know better, the expectation is that we're going to do better. And as we continue to guide ourselves through this journey that we're in right now, we have to level set and we have to make some real commitments. And that also includes to the point that Ruby just made is those financial investments. We are in budget season. Now is the time for us to make sure that our budget reflects the vision and mission that we're saying we want for our schools. And if it doesn't, then we need to challenge ourselves to go back to the drawing board and come back with a budget that is reflective of what this conversation is about that we just had here today. So that's going to be my um, my words of encouragement for all the intergovernmental liaisons that are listening in, what Councilor Mejia is gonna be talking about and you already heard from Councilor Arroyo and Councilor Lara um, and Councilor Breeden and those who joined us here today is that we really wanna make sure that the practice can only be perfected if we practice it. So let's build that muscle and let's make some things happen. And I don't believe we have any more folks set up for um, public testimony. So I just would like to uh, conclude this uh, hearing with my commitment to ensuring that we continue to move through. Um, and we're gonna keep this in committee and keep this conversation going. And I think one of the recommendations that I'd like to make is for us to have some sort of working group um, so that we can we can figure out how we how we continue the conversation beyond the public hearing. And then how do we how do we hold ourselves accountable to that? So with that, I am going to use uh, this nail polish thing to uh, say the, the hearing is adjourned. Thank you all. Have a beautiful night. Okay, bye. Hi. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Yes, sir.